Yes, good evening, everyone. Yeah, good evening, good evening. Uh, how are you? I am good, and you know, lovely to see the logo, the back background. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Yeah, yes. Shall we start? It's already seven or four. Yes. So, please, so now please start. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, all. It's my proud privilege to welcome one and all for the second webinar series of Cave for Edge. The first Cave for Edge was all about episiotomy. It was in association with the academic committee of Cave for, which was very well appreciated and participated. Its huge success has inspired us all to move forward with the webinar series with more vigor and enthusiasm. Today, we are having a session on abnormal uterine bleeding in adolescents and its evidence-based strategies by the Adolescent Committee of K4 in association with Kochi, Malanad, Angamali, Trishur, and Palakkad Society. Yes, adolescence is an important phase of the life of the female and one of the common problems that is AUD. It can affect the physical as well as mental health of the individual and also can cause anxiety to the family members. Hence, to discuss this topic, uh, which we see on daily basis, we have talks, which have we have an impressive line of talks and gripping panel that has been planned. I'm sure that each one of us will tremendously benefit from the session with lots of take home messages. So I request you all to fasten the seat belts and be with us okay. till the end. So let's begin today's session. I welcome dear Dr. Suchitra Sudhir for the welcome address. Thank she is a state coordinator for k Edge. Ma'am is the senior gynecologist in Ashraya Multispeciality Hospital, Kannur. She is the president-elect of k 2025-2026, survey chairperson of k 2023-24, and editor of k Journal 21-23. She has held various prestigious positions in past including President of Kanunu Society, Adolescent Chairperson and Vice President of KFOG, and also has various awards to her credits. Over to you, Madam, for the welcome session. Thank you so much, uh, Sapna. It is a pleasure to be here today for the second uh, session of the KFOG Edge webinars, which is the brainchild of our President, KFOG President, Lion Kunyamoyedin, sir. So first of all, let me welcome our very vibrant, dynamic and young president, Lion Dr. Sorry, Dr. Kunjimin Moidrin, who is the head of the ARMC. And I wish to welcome Dr. Supriya Jaiswal. We have been together for the last program also. She is very, uh, she's a very efficient lady who manages to get everything together on the at the same time. So welcome to you, madam. Actually, we were supposed Thank to have Dr. Sampath Kumari here uh, today, but unfortunately, due to some technical, she is in Musket and she uh, does not have that um, connection. That's why she's not here. So in her absence, I welcome her also. And I would like to welcome our dear Mini, Dr. Mini Balakrishnan, who is the organizer of this whole event, we, uh, this adolescent program. She is the adolescent chairperson of KFOG. And I would like to welcome our past president of KFOG, Dr. Ajit. Dr. Ajit is the stalwart, the, what to say, the support and uh, something like the fountain of knowledge. Whenever we have a doubt, we turn to Dr. Ajit for the uh, clarification. And of course, we have so many dazzling personalities here today. We have Dr. Geeta AP, the pra past president of Trishur OBG Society. Uh, welcome to you, Geeta, madam, Geeta doctor. And uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Priya Darshini and uh, Dr. Tulsi. She's the queen of our KFOG hub. And uh, we have Dr. Anjana Warrior and uh, Dr. Bindu Suresh from, from Angamali. And, and our, the person who is managing this whole event from behind is Dr. Sopna. Dr. Sopna is a very multi-talented person and she comes out with the most amazing salads and dishes. <laughs> so, and Dr. Chandrasekhar Naik and Dr. Preeta, 
I hope I have not left out anybody. That's all I can see on my screen. So welcome to you for a very vibrant, for a very interesting uh, adolescent AUB panel. Thank you for the uh, patient hearing. And let's, as Dr. Sopna said, let's take off. Over to, over to Dr. Mini. Thank you so much, ma'am. I now welcome Dr. Kunumoidin, sir, our present K4 president. He's the medical director and IVF specialist at ARMC Kodikot. And he has held various prestigious posts like Joint Secretary of Indian Fertility Society, President of, he's a founder president of Perindan Malna OG Society. What should I say? He's the leader who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Over to you, sir, for the presidential address. Thank you. Good evening, all. Thank you, Dr. Sapna, for that uh, nice words. And uh, respected chief guest, Dr. Supriya Jaiswal, Dr. Sujitra Sudhir, the state coordinator of this KFOG EDGE program, Dr. Subhash Milia, the secretary general of KFOG, uh, senior faculty, and uh, Dr. Mini Balakshan, the uh, chairperson mm -hmm. of Adolescent Health Committee of uh, KFOG. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I congratulate uh, Dr. Jitra, ma'am, and uh, Dr. Mini for uh, charting out a wonderful academic program okay. on behalf of the Adolescent Health Committee of KFOG. And as uh, the uh, Dr. Sujitra has already mentioned, the KFOG Edge webinar is a series of webinars that will be done for by the all the committees of the KFOG, and there will be three programs for each committees. So we'll be having 21 such programs all across the year. And the idea is to encourage the activities of the committees as well as to enhance the knowledge sharing part, of, part in the obstetrics and gynecology. And adolescent health, uh, it's a very important area that a lot of uh, the researchers and a lot of new things are coming up in this current uh, field. And I'm so happy that we have Dr. Supriya Jaiswal, the chairperson of FOXI, Adolescent Health Committee here to inaugurate this function. At the outset, I wish all the best and grand success for this event. Thank you. Back to Dr. Sapna. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I request uh, Dr. Supriya Jaiswal to kindly inaugurate this uh, web series, uh, today's webinar program, and to have your inaugural address. Over to Dr. Supriya. Thank you very much. Uh, one second. I really bring greetings to all of you, KFOG Edge webinar series from Adolescent Health Committee, FOXI, and also being the vice president of Patna OBGY Society. I really bring lots and lots of <coughs> greetings, warm greetings to all of you. I'm so happy to be a part of this. You have thank you for having me as a chief guest of today's KFOG Age webinar series by Adolescent Committee of KFOG. And such a nice topic you have kept, abnormal uterine bleeding in adolescents. This is so important. Day to day, everybody, all of us face this problem. Thank you, President KFOG. Dr. Kum Kunji Mardin, Dr. Subhash Malia, Secretary General, then Mini Balakrishnan, Chairperson, Adolescent Committee, Foxy, yeah, sorry, of KFOG, and then Dr. Suchitra Sudhir. All of you so vibrant, so active. I'm really amazed. Dr. Gracie Thom Thomas, President COGS, then President Mox, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, Dr. Bindu Menon, Dr. Jesse Gom George, and Emmy, Dr. Emmy. So you have planned such a remarkable and ex excellent webinar in association with Cochin Malanandu, uh, Agamali, Trishur, sorry for the pronunciation, and these Palakad OBGY societies. So well-crafted and curated program. I really um, appreciate you people. And then you have got such good, uh, um, the experts you have kept. And the MOC, Dr. Swapna, she is so nice, so vibrant. The experts, we know that previous chairperson, Dr. Girish Mane and Dr. Ajit 
then the Gracie Thomas and all who who all uh, I am seeing here on the screen, they are really really all vibrant personalities. And this program you have talked out very well. And thank you for having me. And Kerala, just I'll just to share a thing with you that I had uh, had my graduation from JJ Medical College, uh, Davan Gere. So I am very fond of the place. I used to go to Bangalore and from there I used to go to the Davangere and I've got lots of friends in Kerala from right from my MBBS days. So and for Adolescent Health, Adolescent Health Committee, this uh, actually the adolescents, I am very passionate about the adolescent health. I am trying the, all the new subjects that are coming up, mental issues, physical issues, PCOs, AUB, the adolescents, they face lots and lots of problems and the parent, the relationship with the peers, the parents and the teachers are very, very important. And we need to take care of the adolescents. We need to get them vaccinated with the cervical cancer vaccine. So we have to do lots and lots of awareness programs. And Kerala, the literacy rate is so high. And I feel privileged to stay today in between Amongst you people, the most literate uh, mm -hmm. state I can say of all over India. And really thank you very much, President and Secretary, to have me here and for the wonderful invite. Thank you very much. And I wish all the success to the wonderful webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam. Uh, thank you, Supriya, Madam. And we had our honor to have brief acquaintance with Madam on various webinar sessions, actually. And the last one was with the panel on adolescent breast health. Thank you, ma'am, for that all energetic, enthusiastic and pleasant vibe that you spread uh, all over. Thank you for your blessings and best wishes, madam. I go on to the next one. I have the privilege now to um, re um, um, welcome our dear Subhash Malya, sir. Sir needs no official introduction. He's the young and dynamic face. He is everywhere and everybody knows him. He's the Secretary General uh, K4. He's a chairperson of Foxy Endoscopy Committee, working as consultant in previous hospital and baby memorial hospital. He has held various positions and is holding various positions in K4, Foxy, and IAG. I request Subhash, sir, for his blessings. Subhash is not there, I think. He has not joined. You can okay, just sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I welcome for the felicitation, Dr. Gracie Thomas, President, Cochin Society. Uh, I think ma Madam is also unavail uh, unavailable today for um, due to some personal reasons. Um, I um, welcome Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair. He is the President of Malanar Society. Dr. Bindu Menon, President, Trishur Society. Madam, have you joined in? Yeah, Dr. Chandrasekhar is there. Chandrasekhar is there. Ah, Ayata. sir, welcome, sir. Ah, Please, your blessings I'm very and happy, wishes for them. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the way to Manipal as such. So uh, I'm, I, I don't know whether I'm uh, audible or not. Um, audible. Sir, audible, 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 sir. audible, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Uh, 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 I wish all the best for this uh, webinar series. Uh, my train is uh, on the way. Please pardon me. I will be there uh, till the end to hear all of you. So on behalf of Malanado OG Society, I wish all the best for this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I request Dr. Bindu Menon, she's the president of the Shoe Society, to give her blessings and wishes for the today's seminar. Bindu, madam? Bindu is not there. She is not there. Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Jissi Korean, Madam, she is the president of Angamali Society. Madam, your wishes and for the blessings for the seminar. I think Madam has also not joined in. I uh, request Dr. Emmy Globin, president of Palakkad Society, for her wishes for the webinar. I think she, she is also unable to join in. The secretary can say, tell the wishes. <laughs> My all wishes and best luck to the <laughs> webinar. Always, always with K4. Um, it's my proud privilege to introduce and invite our guest of honor, Dr. Girish Mane. Sir is the state coordinator of AMOGS 2024-26, that is Association of Maharashtra Obstetric and Gynec Society. 
He is a past chairperson of Adolescent Health Committee, Foxy, 2019 and 22. Past chairperson of AMOX. Past president of Yamatmal OBG Society. Vice president of Isar Vidhar Chapter. He has received numerous awards and has various publications to his credit. The recent award that he received was as Best Committee Chairperson of Foxy Award 2019-22, Dr. Mehru Banatsi Award. Um, sir, are you there? Sir, are you there? Girish, sorry, sir? sorry, Sapna. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Girish Mane has just now messaged. His yeah. mother is not well, so he's not, oh. he's not able to join. So okay, he has madam. conveyed his blessings to our society and our meeting of this uh, uh, KFOG adolescent panel. Oh, our prayers and I hope that his mother gets well, yeah. madam. I'll send uh, the message so, to him. Yeah. So we'll continue with your permission, madam, and all other consultants. So I invite Dr. Mini Balakrishnan for the vote of thanks. Madam is a consultant gynae at Tertiary Cooperative Hospital. She's a chairperson, KFOX State uh, Adolescent Committee, State Coordinator, Foxy Adolescent Committee, Master Trainer in Communication Skill, and Convener Mission, Pink Health Kerala. Over to you, ma'am. Today's topic is uh, deciphering and managing AUB in adolescent and evidence-based strategy. I have great appreciation to our KFOX president, Dr. Kunya Moidin who has uh, been taking meticulously being uh, in uh, coordinating the events of KFO and uh, great appreciation and thank you our president, Dr. Kunyumadeen, sir, for all the help. A coordinator uh, so of this event, that is so Dr. Sujitra Sudhir, uh, she has taken great effort and ma'am is always pleasant and always happy to coordinate the events. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are blessed to have eminent faculties our national faculties, Supriya Jaiswal, Madam, Ma'am was there always. Whenever there is an adolescent committee activity, Ma'am is always there in front and always supporting us. Thank you, Madam. Our expert, Dr. Girish and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sambat Kumari, Madam, have, because of their personal inconvenience, they are not able to join, but still they have conveyed all their blessings. And um, even they are very active and very interested in joining all the Kerala programs. So, but still, because of that personal inconvenience, they are not able and uh, uh, we really miss them. Dr. Subhash, our secretary, has been the pillar of uh, various uh, activities of our society, whether it is state level or national level. Actually, he's a committee and he's always in all the conference, whether it is online or <laughs> offline. And um, great uh, congrats, Dr. Subhash, and thank you for all the support. Uh, my thanks to all the five soon Dr. Crazy Madam, Dr. Bindu, Dr. Chandra Sharan Naik, sir, uh, Ajisi Kurian Madam, and uh, Amy, our dear friends, all have come and have supported our event. Our guest speaker, Dr. Mini Isaac uh, from Malanadu, Dr. Priyadarshini from Palakkad, Dr. Kirti from Cochin, Dr. Geeta from Trishur, and Dr. They have taken great effort and they are all doing justice to our topic. Hope it will be a very useful one to all of us. And um, also uh, great, uh, thanks to the uh, our expert, Dr. Ajit sir, uh, who is the professor and always supporting the KFO, who was the past president also. And whenever we ask for any help, sir, we'll be always there. Our today's panelists, Dr. Anjana, Dr. Bindu, Dr. Preeti, Dr. Smithy, and Dr. Tulasi, all are our hub mates and they have uh, hope this will be a great, uh, useful and very good uh, panel discussion. And our moderator, everything credit goes to Dr. Sopna because uh, very, uh, uh, very, very prompt and very meticulous uh, is uh, our moderator, Dr. Sopna, because she makes the show uh, going on without any flaws, thanks to uh, Sopna. And uh, I all the blessing to if I have missed anyone, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Estria, also for supporting the plan. Thank you so much, Bini, uh, madam. Uh, so with the inaugural function, which has uh, so well done, we start with our session one. And it's a, a talk. We have an array of beautiful talks. And we have our experts, Girish Mani sir could not join us as said by Mini Madam because of ill health of, her, uh, of his mother. We have Dr. Ajit S. Uh, what can I say? He is my dear teacher. And uh, whenever I have him in front, I am really in awe. 
he was the pre, he's the president kerala chapter rcog fellow representative aicc rcog south zone additional professor now government medical college trivandrum he was the past president of a4 2021 22 past president of kannanur ong society past vice president and joint secretary of a4 past chairperson of research committee of k4 and he is also an mrcog examiner along with the experts we have chairperson dr gracy thomas madam and gc kurian madam so let's start with our first topic with dr mini isaac madam from collingeri uh mini isaac madam is a professor of obg in collingeri medical college she has published various papers in national journals she is a member of uh, mogs and her area of interest is gynec oncology and laparoscopic surgery she is going to present understanding abnormal uterine bleeding in adolescence over to you madam yeah swapna before starting the talk i request dr subhash he has joined to say a few oh. words dr oh, subhash sir. Please. So, sorry sir sorry sir i was held up in a personal function sir thank you very much uh, president kunimajin sir Uh, senior members of the fraternity of rajit sir and, and 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 all other members again i would like to thank uh, dr dr mini madam who has taken all the efforts in in doing this wonderful program and i i would like to thank all the president secretaries of all the five societies of angamali trichur malnadu kochi and uh, alappuzha for i mean palakkad for this wonderful meeting and uh, i i'm already i think i'm already late i i'm sorry for that so i would uh, wish all the best wishes to all the all the organizers and then we'll move we'll move forward thank you very much sir thank you very much apna thank you and hello thank subhash so subhash dr supriya madam madam supriya madam namaste are madam sorry i was sorry, missing madam, you madam, actually madam, <laughs> sorry madam sorry mai 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 matlab beech mein kahi pe atka tha sorry madam thoda sa i i i welcome i welcome the chairperson of uh, the adolescent committee and a good friend dr supriya madam for this yes. wonderful meeting yeah Welcome, welcome to the K Fog series, ma'am. Thank you very Thank much you. for joining, ma'am. I'm ma so Thank happy, you, you know. I'm very happy and overwhelmed to join this webinar. I'll be there throughout. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for your one. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Subhash sir. Thank you, Supriya madam, for the kind words. And I request Mini madam to continue the session. No, we'll. Yes, a very good evening. Audible. Ah, yeah. 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 Very good evening to all. First, let me thank the organizers, K for Adolescent Committee, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this webinar. Now, coming to this topic, as you all know, the menstruation is monthly shedding of endometrium due to changes in the hormonal activity. Phenomenon where there is repeated tissue injury repair. without residual scarring and loss of function as we all know you know this who has um, uh, uh, from the 10 to 19 years is the adolescent age group and uh, more than 50 percentage it this adolescent constitute uh, about 1/10th of the population in india more than 50 percentage of them present with some menstrual disorders either it may be uh he heavy irregular bleeding or amenorrhea or it may be dysmenorrhea so in the initial events of adolescence the menarche the periods may be irregular maybe by 3 to 5 years it becomes regular so the dilemma is whether to consider this as physiological or should you do some investigations or diagnostic procedures to exclude any pathological causes coming to the physiology of menstrual cycle as we all know estrogen and progesterone are involved in the endometrial development the endo the estrogen stimulates the progesterone receptors and the progesterone response depends upon the is uh, estrogen level the, it acts on the estrogen primed endometrium in addition to estrogen and progesterone there are androgen and glucocorticoid receptors which also helps in the tissue degen uh, regeneration and control of bleeding the progesterone st stabilizes the endometrium by influencing the uh, level of matrix metalloproteinases and it stimulates the tissue factor and plasminogen activator inhibitor what happens when there is progesterone withdrawal is there is a uh, program cell death influx of inflammatory mediators the matrix metalloproteinases which helps in the degeneration 
of this extracellular matrix. And there are prostaglandins, which produces vasospasm and hypoxia. This hypoxia is important in that this hypoxia inducible factor uh, initiates expression of host factors involved in tissue repair. So what uh, controls the bleeding is vasospasm, platelet aggregation, clot formation, and epithelial regeneration, the estrogen of the uh, produced from the developing follicle. Those with heavy menstrual bleeding, there are they are found to have larger spiral arterioles, reduced vascular smooth muscle proliferation, reduced vascular tone, and reduced hypoxia. And there is also increased fibrinolytic activity in those with heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, cycles in the immediate post menarche phase, most of them are anovulatory due to inconsistent positive feedback. So what do you mean by this positive feedback? When the estrogen level increases, it has a positive effect on the pituitary producing LH surge, which results in ovulation and progesterone production. So in the first two years, 50% are anovulatory. And maybe by five years, 75% may be ovulating. That is 25% may be anovulatory. So when you consider the cycle length, in the first year, the cycle length may be may vary from 21 to 45 days with an average of maybe 32 days. By 30 year, by three years, 60 to 80 percentage will have a cycle length of 21 to 34 days, similar to that of an adult. And maybe by seventh year, the cycle length is less variable. The FIGO has uh, recommended the AUB to be the abnormal bleeding to be termed as AUB. That is a, a, a menstrual uh, irregularity, which is abnormal in duration, volume, frequency, or regularity. So they have classified it as acute AUB, where there is episode of heavy bleeding, which is of sufficient quantity to require immediate intervention to minimize or prevent further blood loss. And non-gestational chronic AUB is defined as bleeding from the uterus that is abnormal in duration, volume, frequency, or regularity, which is present for preceding six months. In 2007, the FIGO has put certain terminologies and definition of normal menstruation for non-gestational AUB in the reproductive age. And they have abolished certain terminologies like menorrhagia, metroregia, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, hypomenorrhea, which are poorly defined with no constant uh, meaning. In 2011, the FIGO uh, published two, a pair of system, the AUB system one, which deals with the terminology and definitions, and AUB system two, which say it states about the causes for AUB, like the uh, uh, palm coin where the palm denotes the structural reason which can be imaged or may be diagnosed with histopathological examination. The coin uh, denotes the non-structural causes which cannot be imaged, but it can be studied uh, by a detailed history taking, clinical examination and certain lab investigations. In adolescent bleeding, it is mainly because of this uh, non-structural causes. And 2018, the FIGO updated the also modifications were made and the system one, that is clarification on terminology and in system two, reassignment of entities and subclassification of leomyoma was published. So when you uh, look into this FIGO, uh, AUB system one for adult, uh, the frequency is 24 to 38 days and uh, maybe regularity. What do you mean by regularity? The, Longer, the, the shortest to longest cycle variation is less than seven to nine days. For the adult, the, from 18 to 25 years, uh, nine days is considered as the normal. Anything more than 10 will be abnormal. So what is the normal and abnormal menstrual pattern in adolescence? When you look at the parameter cycle length, normal is 21 to 45 days. Abnormal, less than 21 days is called frequent cycle. More than 45 days is infrequent. Duration of menses less than 8 days is the normal. Prolonged is more than 8 days. 
the amount of bleeding normal is 30 to 40 ml that is three to six soaked tampons or pads each day heavy uh, according to nice guidelines any excessive loss that interferes with physical social emotional and material quality of life is called heavy menstrual bleeding then the painful periods uh, in a, most of these cycles are anovulatory so likely to be painless but uh, painful cramps when cycle becomes ovulatory, but usually they respond to simple analgesics. What is abnormal is persistent pain, not responding to simple medical treatment, and they might have an underlying pelvic pathology such as endometriosis or Mullerian anomaly. So when you put this uh, palm coin system for adolescent bleeding, as we said earlier, the structural abnormalities may be very uncommon, one, one to two percentage. The non-structural, the common one being the ovulatory dysfunction and the bleeding disorder. The C, the coagulopathy, includes uh, general population, maybe the causes for coagulopathy or bleeding disorder may be 1 to 2 percentage. But in adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding, it can vary from 5 to 35 percentage. So the common being the von Willebrand's disease, platelet dysfunction, like uh, glansman's thrombasthenia or the uh, uh, this, uh, Bernard Solier syndrome, and then this immune thrombocytopenia, or ITP, then clotting factor or individual clotting factor deficiency. The use of anticoagulants actually should come uh, in the newer uh, thing uh, as I, the iatrogenic class. The ovulatory dysfunction. Mainly it is physiological, that is because of the immaturity of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, uh, because of the uh, positive feedback which produces the LH surge may not be there. Then the other causes of ovulatory dysfunction being thyroid disorders, polycystic ovary syndrome, hyperprolactinemia, the other can produce amenorrhea. The E, endometrial it's mainly the endometritis due to sexually transmitted infection, pelvic inflammatory disease like tuberculosis, and maybe pregnancy related. The iatrogenic will include the breakthrough bleeding with the use of hormonal methods of contraception. So when you uh, take the history, it is important to ask about the uh, sexual or physical activity. And because it may be related, these problems may be related to even pregnancy or the pelvic inflammatory disease or the use of some hormonal methods of contraception like OC pills or Depo-Provera injection. The end, the not otherwise classified, uh, will include trauma and foreign body. When should you suspect this coagulation abnormality? If the heavy menstrual bleeding is there since menarche or one of the following like surgery related, previous surgery related bleeding or bleeding associated with dental work or two or more uh, factors like bruising two times per month, epistaxis one to two times per month, gum or nose bleeding, family history of bleeding disorder. So when should you start investigating in adolescent girls when it is more than 45 or less than 21 days duration, bleeding lasting longer than seven days, when there is flooding episodes, changing paths more often one to two hours, soiling clothes and bed sheet. Uh, can you put the diagnosis in this palm coin system? You can do that. Then we'll have to address each component, but it is quite cumbersome. So maybe you can use the abbreviation. If it is due to ovulatory dysfunction, you can write it as AUBO. So to conclude, the menstrual cycles in adolescents are often irregular due to immature hypothalamo ovarian axis, hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis. The menstrual disorders in adolescents affects the quality of life, iron deficiency, it disrupts sports and social activities and affects school attendance. The underlying factor that causes AUV may have potential for long-term health consequences like this bleeding disorder. The commonest cause of AUV in adolescent is ovulatory dysfunction and second being bleeding disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam, for that crisp and clear information. We have got an outline about adolescent AOB. Let's go to the go next section. Hormonal and non-hormonal strategies for adolescent AUB by Dr. Priyadarshini M. Priyadarshini, madam, is my great friend. 
and she is the clinical secretary of Palakkad ONG Society, and she's a senior consultant and an excellent surgeon at Tangam Hospital. Over to you, madam. Priyansi, you are not audible. Rain mute. Priyadarshini, can you hear me? You are not audible. Unmute, madam. See, even after unmuting, it's not audible. Hello? Oh, now it is audible. Okay. Yeah, good evening. And... Um... Thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I represent an adolescent uh, society. We have at Palakkad just formed a uh, society just a couple of months ago. So talking on a, talking on an adolescent uh, topic is itself interesting. I'm going to talk on hormonal and non-hormonal strategies in adolescent AUB. So to manage adolescent uh, AUBs, there are certain criteria which need to be taken into consideration. Some of them are patient specific and it could be medication specific. Now, patient specific criteria are depend upon the nature of presentation. That means as we already heard, it could be as an acute AUB, chronic AUB, depending upon her medical conditions, like uh, she may be already having an underlying condition or she may be having some comorbidities, her, the compliance to treatment and her preferences. Medication specific are the cost and availability of medications, but the history of prior medi uh, medicines which have been attempted and whether we need to augment the therapy which she already is on. Now, we already heard what an acute and a chronic AUB is. Now, to manage an acute AUB, it depends upon how she, pre uh, how she is present uh, presenting to us, the amount of bleeding, whether she is hemodynamically stable, so most of these cases would require hospitalization and to stabilize her by giving by IV fluids. Uh, then uh, we have also to take her blood samples for cross-matching and the initial lab investigation. There could be a need for blood transfusion. The most important thing which we have to remember is to rule out pregnancy complication, even though she's an adolescent. Uh, controlling of bleeding, the important drug for controlling bleeding is a monophasic combined oral contraceptive pills, usually 30 to 50 microgram of ethyl estradiol as given in a high dose of one pill every four to eight hourly till the bleeding subsides and then gradually taper to one's daily doses. Tranexamic acid could also be given at 10 milligram per kg body weight, not exceeding 600 milligram per dose. Progestins it has also a role in acute AUB, but it's mainly indicated when estrogens are contraindicated. That is when people have a history of uh, migraine with aura or prior DVT, thromboembolic disease. These are the cases 
uh, where progestins are given. Otherwise, usually it is the combined oral contraceptive pills which are preferred. Norethindrone 10 milligram as QID or uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate 20 milligram 6 to 8 hourly till the bleeding stops and then continue it as a maintenance therapy. IV estrogen has a role when patient is unable to take oral medication or bleeding is uncontrolled after 24 hours of hormonal therapy. IV estrogen is as uh, equine estrogen 25 milligram 4 to 6 hourly till bleeding is controlled and then it could be switched to con combined oral contraceptive pills and they need to be given antiemetics to prevent vomiting. But the main thing with IV estrogen is it is not easily available. It's not available in our country. The second line of management in these girls are GNRH analogs, which are usually not preferred because of its side effects. Desm Desmopressin has a role uh, in, because it's a synthetic analog of vasopressin. It increases concentration of one Willebrand's factor and factor eight. It also causes platelet adhesion. It's given as 0.3 microgram per kg IV over 15 to 30 minutes and may be repeated if there is no response. It's also available as intranasal and subcutaneous preparation. So uh, the only thing which we need to remember is we have to be careful giving desmopressin in patients who are bleeding profusely and we have already managed them with a lot of IV fluids because there is a chance of fluid overload and hyponatremia. There may be a role of replacement of coagulation factors if she has got any deficiency. Then surgery is always a life-saving measure. All these patients in acute AUB do require a long-term follow-up. So with menstrual calendar, nowadays we have got uh, uh, mobile apps available, so which could be of use. Then diet supplementation, particularly iron supplementation is very important. Continue hormonal therapy till the hematocrit returns to normal and reassurance, reassurance and counseling goes a long way in the management of these girls. Now, when it comes to chronic AUB, our management will depend upon how her, what her complaints are, that is her, the way she is bleeding, the duration, the flow, and also depending upon her hemoglobin concentration. Now, the aim of management is, at, is to control bleeding to treat and prevent anemia, treat the cause, as well as prevent recurrences. The, the goal is to have a synchronized endometrial shedding at regular intervals. Now, since most of these girls, as we have already heard, have an ovulatory bleeding, which is due to the immaturity of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, if just giving them some time will itself correct the situation. Once the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis matures, it is usually self-correcting. So in many cases, just reassurance alone would be the only thing that is required. In some, we may have to supplement with oral iron. And those who are bleeding profusely, we might need a long-term hormonal treatment. Now, the options available to us are hormonal, non-hormonal, and surgical methods. Now, surgery is you, uh, drugs. To usually, the uh, non-hormonal methods are given to reduce the flow of the bleed, uh, and non-hormonal -hor methods are required to make the cycles regular. Surgery is only indicated when there is an underlying cause or when the, when the medical management doesn't work, and it will be dealt with by the next speaker. Now, of the non-hormonal methods, antifibrinolytic agents, tranexamic acid is a synthetic derivative of amino acid lysine. It exerts its antifibrinolytic activity through the reversible blockade of lysine binding sites on plasminogen, thereby preventing the formation of plasmin, hence stabilizing the clot by preventing degradation of fibrin. It's available as IV and oral formulation. It's given as 10 mg per kg IV every 8 hours or 20 to 25 mg per kg orally every 8 hours. No tapering is required. Days to be administered vary depending upon the clinical presentation, and it usually causes about 40 to 50 percent reduction in the amount of bleeding. Gastrointestinal side effects uh, is dose dependent. The contraindication of use is those with intrinsic risk for thromboembolic disease. Even though there is a uh, theoretical risk of causing thromboembolic diseases, 
with concurrent use of combined oral contraceptive pills. In practice, it has not been found so. So in cases where uh, and, and, uh, where concomitant use of antifibrinolytic and OCPs are required, particularly since our age group is in the young patients, it, might, it can be done. Aminocaprionic acid is also an antifibrinolytic agent and its method, mode of action is almost same to that of transexamic acid. It's given as four to five grams IV over 60 minutes and then tapered to maintenance. But only thing is it's not easily available. Then the next non-hormonal therapies are the antifibrinolytic, uh, antiprostaglandins. NSAIDs inhibit the biosynthesis of cyclic endoperoxidases, which convert arachidonic acid to prostaglandins. Mephinomic acid particularly has also an effect directly on uh, interfering at the receptor sites. NSAIDs reduce prostaglandin levels by, inhibits, by inhibiting cyclooxygenases and decreasing the ratio of prostacycline to thromboxane. There is about 20 to 46 percent reduction in the blood flow. It is mainly useful for uh, ovulatory bleeding, those people who have a regular cycle, but heavy menstrual bleeding uh, are the people who have use uh, who have better use of these agents. It, the advantage of this is that it reduces the pain also along with bleeding. Mephenemic acid can give, be given as 500 milligram three times a day. Ibuprofen and naproxen are also the other drugs, and these are usually given during the days of flow. The main contraindication to use of prostaglandins are those for those with coagulation disorders. And if we have patients who come to us at the time of menarche or very soon after menarche with heavy menstrual bleed, these are the antiprostaglandins should not be used as a first line of treatment. Ethamsalate is one of the drugs which we use, but uh, it, it acts mainly by increasing the platelet adhesiveness and aggregation and improving the vascular stability. But it's not so widely uh, recommended because of its inconsistent efficacy. Then the hormonal methods of that combined oral contraceptives are the most commonly used in this age group of patients. Estrogen causes rapid growth of endometrium over the denuded surfaces. It also promotes platelet aggregation, progesterone supports and organizes the endometrium. And since most of our patients are anovulatory patients, the best drug for them would be or combined oral contraceptive pills. 30 microgram of ethanyl estradiol with levonorgestrel or norgestrel can be given. There is about 35 to 65% reduction in the blood loss. It can be either given cyclically, extended regime, uh, that means continuously for about three months and then having a withdrawal or continuously for three to six months. Although extended regime may lead to fewer scheduled bleedings and faster recovery from anemia, breakthrough bleeding is a common side effect during the first several months of the use and which may not be taken well by these girl, girls and may be considered even considered as a treatment failure. There were concerns initially regarding uh, height, uh, gaining height of, while giving estrogens now we have understood that most of the girls attain 95% of their height in the initial growth spot, which occurs before menarche. So there is no harm in giving them estrogen. Progesterone only uh, pills are also available. Progesterone supports and organizes the endometrium so that an organized slug to the basal layer occurs after withdrawal. Progesterone also increases the PGF to uh, PGE ratio. It is indicated for those who have contraindications to estrogen, but we have to counsel them for breakthrough bleeding. Metroxyprogesterone acetate as 60 milligram daily in divided doses, followed by 20 milligram daily for three weeks, and then continuing the therapy as 10 milligram tablets for six to 12 months. Norethisterone acetate as 30 milligram per day, tapered to 10 milligram for three weeks. All these drugs can be continued for six to 12 months. Injection depot medroxyprogesterone is usually not given in this age group because of its uh, problem with prolonged uh, uh, amenorrhea and breakthrough bleedings. Levonorgestrel uh, containing IUCD is very useful for the reproductive age group, but uh, not so with uh, the adolescent age group. The other options are androgens, GnRH analogs, selective progesterone receptor modulate ulipristal, these are usually not given unless or until other medications do not work. 
We must also remember to treat the causes like hyper and hypothyroidism, pregnancy related problems, trauma, foreign body, etc., which should be done along with managing bleeding. So to conclude, the hormonal methods are effective in controlling adolescent AUB. Their use is often limited by lack of compliance. Combined oral contraceptives are the first line to control bleeding. Non-hormonal options are limited to tranexamic acid and methanemic acid. Treatment of the underlying cause forms a part of the treatment. Counseling is also important as, uh, as part of treatment. Long-term follow-up of these girls are warranted. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you for that very elaborate talk on treatment outline. Thank you so much. Next, treat, uh, next we have Dr. Kirti Rajan, who is a consultant OBGY and laparoscopic surgeon in Renai Medicity, Kochi. She's an invited speaker and operating faculty at various national conferences. She's a laparoscopic training faculty also. She has also received a best paper award in 2018 APCOG state conference. Over to you, Dr. Kirti. She would be speaking on approaches to adolescent AUB treatment. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible, but yeah, your slides are not seen. Yeah, yeah. One second. The slide visible? Uh, not till now. Not yet. Share screen. Yeah, I've shared it and I'm able to see it. Can you see it now? No. No. Uh, have you double tapped? Yeah, it's coming in. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, if you're seeing it, yeah. you put it into the slideshow, please. Yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah. audible and visible. Okay. Just a minute. All right. So um, the topic I'll be talking is on surgical approach to adolescent AUB management. So it's something that rarely, very, very rarely happens because most of the patients like uh, uh, Dr. Mini and Priyadarshini Madam had uh, told and uh, in the, during their presentation that most of them require reassurance and uh, medical management. A patient in an adolescent coming to a surgical treatment is quite rare. So that's the first thing. And the second is by the time they come to a surgical treatment, they might have crossed the adolescent period. So they might have tried all the medical managements and everything, and then they might have come to the surgical uh, plan, and by then they might have already crossed the adolescent. That's the first thing that um, we'll have to understand in this uh, topic. So this, I'm not going to going into the detail of this picture because it actually shows the structural causes and uh, the other side, the coin, that is all the coagulopathy, ovarian and endometrial iatrogenic and other causes. But mostly what I'll be dealing with in the surgical is the palm part of it. That is a polyp, adenomyosis, leomyoma and malignancies. So coming to the first thing, I'm not going into the details of all this because all this has already been mentioned. Just that the main problem with AUB in adolescence is immaturity of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. That's a basic thing. So it takes some time. It takes at least a minimum of six months to three years for the girl, for the adolescent girl to actually have a normal menstruation because all what they will be having is an anovulatory bleeding. So that's what we have to understand. But it's very important that we rule out other causes like thyroid disorders or PCOD, hypoprolactinemia, and all, all other issues. So we give them some time frame, that's six months to three years. And they can even have these skipped menses for at least a period of three months. So these are the basic concepts that we have to understand in adolescent AUB. So the question is, if 
a structural issue is there for an adolescent girl? Can we do a hysteroscopy? Can we do a hysteroscopy or not? Because what happens is most of the time when a hysteroscopy is done, the cervix is caught. So do you actually need to catch the cervix for a hysteroscopy? Because the main thing is the hymen, it's considered like a holy thing. So if you actually have to catch the cervix, there's a chance that the hymen can rupture. So these are the basic things in adolescent. So you can actually do a hysteroscopy without even catching the cervix. This is a vaginoscopically done procedure. You first, you can see the whole vagina. You can see the cervix. Is my video visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Very much so you can see how it's going. The whole, okay. The whole scope goes in very beautifully inside without even catching the cervix. So the basic concept is you have to make sure you can see a dark area. Make sure that the dark area keeps is in center. So I just rewind it once more. There's a black area. Can you see my marker? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we can see. You make make sure that the dark area is in center. So if you focus it like that, a diagnostic hysteroscopy is very simple. And once you actually, you know, uh, a getaway is there, you can you make sure that you know you're right inside the cavity. The only thing you have to avoid is you know overshooting and you know uh, giving more pressure. It just goes in smoothly. So you have those small miniature hysteroscopes that you can use for all these procedures. So this is just a vaginoscopy that I wanted to show. The next, this is a video, this is not an adolescent case, but this is just in case. Uh, personally, I don't think, you know, a polyp can uh, be, pre is very common in an adolescent age group, but if at all it is, this is how you actually have to do it. The same procedure, vaginoscopy, and then it's like a no touch method. So you can use a scissor and grasp at the base of the polyp and with the scissor itself, you know, you don't have to catch the other side of the polyp. With the scissor, make sure that the base of the polyp is cut. The problems that you can face with it is once the base is cut, the whole of the polyp might just, you know, keep uh, wandering inside the cavity because of the pressure of the hysteroscope uh, fluid, distension media. So what you do is as soon as that is cut, just off the saline or off the infusion and so that it won't wobble inside and then you can catch the polyp. It's the same with even a, a fibroid polyp or a small fibroid, you know, catch it with a grasper and then you can just twist it and make sure that it has come up. So this is regarding the polyp part of it. Now the next video. This is a case. Uh, this is a very interesting case, actually. This is a girl who had, I'll just pause it and uh, brief about the history. This is a girl who had um, Marina coil inside for fibroid uterus. She uh, stays in a Western country and she was uh, suggested for a Marina coil and that was used and she's sexually active in her adolescent age group. Now, the thing is, she was very obese, class 3 obesity. She was advised for a sleeve gastrectomy when she turned into 20 years of age. But she refused all that. She was 25, again, class 3 obesity. She was again advised sleeve gastrectomy. So during the procedure, uh, or might be like before the procedure, a surgeon had actually referred to the gy gynec site in view of her marina coil because she was not very comfortable with it because she had recurrent uh, vaginal infections. So she was suggested, you know, whether to remove it or just to, you know, replace the marina coil. Anyway, since this patient is anyway going ahead for a surgery, it was advised that, you know, there was a fibroid which was actually indenting the endometrium, which is causing an AUB for her. And that's why because a sleeve gastrectomy was also done along with it, that's why the fibroid was also taken. And fibroid was taken as well as the marina coil was also removed. So this is just, can you see the video? Hello? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay. I'm just a bit uh, doubtful if the video is uh, visible the video is and clear slow, or not. But we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So this is just a fibroid. You can see it's something like a dumbbell shape. A small fibroid is not the problem. The problem is if the fibroid is intending the cavity and causing the AUV, which in which the patient is not clinically, you know, uh, comfortable uh, in spite of using a medical management for AUV. So it's very important. This was just done because the patient was undergoing a surgery for another cause. And so anyway, it's an intraperitoneal surgery. So rather better go for a myomectomy also. This is just a suturing part. I'll just fast forward that. What is used is a... Uh, VLOG sutures, barbed sutures. 
the most important thing is to make sure that the tubes are not entangled or caught while suturing because the, for them the fertility also is a, a very important factor and also that the endometrial cavity is not damaged. So just fast forward it. It's like a baseball sutures that are taken and the fibroid it's actually taken through the left lateral or the side ports. Coming on, okay, this is just in case this is not an adolescent lady. This is in case a myoma is there. Very rare that a myoma of this size is usually seen in an adolescent. But if so, I'm just showing the uh, myomectomy video of it. If so, this is how a myomectomy is done. You put the incision, a vertical and an or an oblique, depending upon how, if you are an ipsilateral or if you are a contralateral, depending upon that, you know, uh, assign how you put the incision. Uh, I have put almost like an oblique incision. This is a fibroid that was actually intending the endometrial cavity, which made the uh, patient actually have a hemoglobin drop to about 5.6 grams. So blood transfusion was given and this patient was taken up for a surgery. You can see how beautifully the fibroid is actually coming out. What is used is a harmonic scalpel on the right side and on the left side, you can just use a grasper. So the most important things is what instruments you use. You need minimum instruments and doing the surgery perfectly. So you can see that the myoma screw actually does half the work. What is used on the right side right now is the myoma screw. And the left side, it's just the grasper. So it's just like peeling off. But the thing is, it's important to know where exactly to peel off, where exactly the traction should be given, and where exactly the electrosurgical instruments are used. In cases where it's actually intending the endometrium, it's important that you actually use the cautery with caution and you cut it at very important places. Like don't cut it very close to the endometrial cavity because you'll actually damage the basal layer of the endometrium. You can see how beautifully the fibroid is actually coming up. I'll just fast forward it a bit. And in cases like adolescent, if at all there are fibroids and you give multiple drugs, there's a chance that the fibroid can actually undergo degenerative changes. So it sometimes it gets difficult to actually get a good plane for the fibroid. So Technically, you should keep in mind that, you know, there is a chance that the planes might not be very perfectly okay if you, if she has had multiple treatments for the uh, fibroid prior. This is just the suturing part. I'll just fast forward this again. The same thing is used, the baseball sutures. And finally, approximation is very important. And also, the tubes have to be seen properly. Now, this is just the other part of it, malignancies. The... Most common thing that we have to understand is a malignancy seen in a seen in an adolescent age group, having an AUP is very rare. Most of the patients who come will be, you know, of an adolescent having a malignancy could be an ovarian origin and they will come with abdominal distension or an incidental finding. And if at all seen, the common ones are like sex cord uh, stromal tumors, granulosa cell tumors, which are actually estrogen uh, secreting tumors. So what happens is there in such cases, because it's an estrogen dependent, that's why there's a chance of AUB. So the management of the uh, malignancy is just the same routine that has got nothing different to see, uh, in between a, a reproductive age group or an adolescent age group. So it's the same regarding the malignancies. Going on to the next, the more the patients with adolescent uh, in adolescent age group with an ovarian cyst if at all an ovarian cyst is there, won't be in relation to an AUB usually. They will have symptoms like abdominal distension or pain or severe pain if there is torsion. So these kind of cases are actually not in the palm coin, but if they have any association of AUB, yes, you can actually consider them in the palm coin too. So this is just a case of torsion, torsion ovary. And most of these adolescents, like I said, and might be most of you might have encountered also they will come with definitely pain or abdominal distension. Even today in OPD, I had a young girl with just abdominal distension, almost 18 to 20 weeks size. So they come with mostly those kind of complaints. You can e either put the trocar directly into the cyst, drain the cyst completely using a suction, and then do a cystectomy. It's very important that the cystectomy you do is very, uh, try to do it perfectly. The problem what happens is to get a good cyst wall. If you inject vasopressin, yes, you get a good cyst wall. But each time you take a cyst wall, you might feel that is a correct plane. How much ever you keep stripping, that might be a correct plane. So it's very important that you take a very thin cyst wall. 
but it shouldn't you know create button holes or it should actually come intact so those are the most important things here you can see the cyst wall coming pretty well and you can use something like a three grasper technique because if it's a large cyst uh, the the problems you can face is after a particular point of time, there might be a confusion which is a cyst wall or uh, which is a ovarian tissue. So it's important that you actually catch one part of the cyst wall with another grasper. You can see another grasper doing the work. One part of the cyst wall is actually uh, grasping the ovarian tissue and the other part is actually grasping it. So that the plane comes perfectly. You can see the right side is actually catching the ovarian tissue and the left side is catching the cyst wall. Right side, sorry, the right side is the cyst wall. The important thing is once a, an ovarian cyst is seen, it's always important you see the other side ovary also, the other side tube also, the POD. Because it's just not the mass that is right in front of you that is important. You visualize the whole picture just to rule out any anomalies or anything because it's an adolescent girl. You can take the cyst wall in another pattern also without rupturing it, especially in cases like dermoids. Because the important thing is you do not want any spillage. Especially in dermoids, what happens is if there's spillage, there's a chance of chemical peritonitis, which is pretty rare, but still you do not want it. Sometimes there's a chance that, you know, the rupture can happen few things are not in our hands but try that it doesn't rupture and maximum keep it in the pouch of Douglas and do the uh, peeling or the procedures because what happens is even if there is spillage it's all in the pouch of Douglas which is actually easier to suction out once that is done you can put it in the in bag and take it out through the left lateral port what you can do is after pulling it out through the left lateral port you can puncture it and suction it out so that everything all the contents are inside the bag itself this is just the ASRM Mullerian anomaly classification. Even in these cases, you can see I've just put some star marks uh, in few uh, conditions. This is a unicornate uh, part wherein there is a communicating uh, right or left unicornate with a right or left uh, uterine horn communicating at the level of the cervix. So these kind of cases also can have AUV. So the treatment line depends upon how, how you treat an anomaly. If the patient, are, uh, such patients in the adolescent age group are having AUB, medically managed, still not better, it's always important that you rule out other anomalies, do an MRI if it's a cervical or a vaginal issues that you doubt, or an ultrasound will be good enough for if it's a uterine, that, uterine anomalies that you doubt, 3D ultrasound. So the treatment of the anomalies depend upon how it is. Suppose it's in cases like, you know, unicornate uterus with the rudimentary functioning horn, then excision is important. If it's cases like diadelphus with a septum you can see here a vaginal septum is there in such cases there can be uh, AUB especially where, when there are small gaps or small holes in these septum that means it's not completely resolved so in such cases also when AUB is there resection or uh, you know excision of the septum is what is done sorry incision of the septum is what is done so it depends upon what anomaly you see that the further treatment of the AUB happens the same thing in other cases like obstructed hemivagina, same thing. An incision on the septum is what is important. Now, this is another, I have a, this is a last video, but just before saying about this video, it's important to know what is acum and what is Roberts. Acum is like an accessory cavitated uterine malformation. You can see it's like a normal uterine cavity will be there on the myometrium, preferably mostly seen on the right round ligament, sometimes seen on the left, near the left round ligament also. So it's like there is a cavity functioning endometrium is there, is happening there. But the thing is, it doesn't have any communication with the fallopian tube on that side. In case of Roberts, it's an asymmetrical uterine septum. You can see there's a con continuation with the fallopian tube. So in case of a Roberts, the treatment, what is done is you need to incise the septum so that the cavity is roomy enough. In case of acute, what is to be done is excision of this cavitated malformation. Now, this is an adolescent. Why I'm saying this is because in adolescent age groups, acum can also present and acum can also present with dysmenorrhea. They can also present with abnormal uterine bleeding. So here, to differentiate between an acum, like in this picture, to differentiate between an acum and a robot, it's important that a hysteroscopy is done. In acum, you will have a normal cavity. You will see both the tubes. 
because this acum whatever is there that malformation will be there in the myometrium so it will be something like a fibroid itself so the cavity might be normal but in case of robots what happens is when you do a hysteroscopy you will see only one ostia you won't see the other ostia because like said it's an asymmetrical septum so you can see this patient did a diagnostic lab saw the mass there's another differentiating uh, diagnosis it can be any uh, degenerated fibroid also but definitely they had said in the ultrasound it's a cavity a small cavity is there so a hysteroscopy was done for this girl you can see one ostia you can just wait and you will see the other ostia too it's a roomy cavity so the differential diagnosis of a robots is also ruled out and that is the other cavity the, the other ostia that you're seeing and then proceed with the laparoscopy any malformation it's always important to have a 3d picture 3d ultrasound or if a 3D ultrasound is not available, to do a diagnostic hysteroscopy as well, because you might miss anomalies. This is just the excision of the uh, malformation, accessory cavitated uterine malformation. I just fast forward. It's just like a myomectomy itself. What is being used is a harmonic. It might look like a big chunk is taken, but the important thing is it's on the lateral wall. And once cut, you will actually see the big cavity with a functioning endometrium. Once that is done, it's a routine procedure, suturing with a barbed suture. Small bleeders in these cases will actually, uh, you know, stop in some time as soon as you suture it and tighten it very well. So need not worry about that. All this actually works very well when the vasopressin is given. There's no problem even in adolescent girls if you use vasopressin. I use around 20 units in 100 cc of uh, saline. And if, even in reproductive age group or uh, elderly ladies, what happens is there's a chance of transient uh, arrhythmia, but that actually settles. But make sure that the anesthetist is aware that you're using vasopressin. While suturing, what is important is make sure that the tubes are not entangled with it and make sure the other tube and everything is... Okay, so you can see the last bite after once the last bite is taken, the tubes are checked, it's all not entangled with the sutures. Thank you so much, and thank you, the organizing team, for actually giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kirti, for that wonderful uh, videos and uh, slideshows. It was not a common approach that we use for actually adolescent, but your slideshows and videos are very interesting and we definitely have got an insight into one. Thank you so much for that. Next, pretty rare, come... it's very rare, but uh, yeah. it was a topic. So it's so wonderful yeah. of you to show videos for that. And that's very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Kirti. And we have our next uh, speaker, Dr. Geeta AP, madam. Uh, she's a beautiful person inside out, a beautiful singer. She's a senior consultant at Mother Hospital Trishur, immediate past president of Trishur OBD Vice Society. And she's going to deal with a topic that we all always leave apart, you know, and that's the psychological aspect of AUB in adolescence. Okay. <laughs> Um, Chandrasekhar, can you mute? I would like to say the same thing about you. Uh, probably except maybe the singing part, but you are a beautiful person inside out. And thank you, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity. And so far, we have been hearing about the uh, uh, pathophysiology and the basics of AUB, about uh, the management, medical management, and even the surgical management. So probably the only thing left is to make sure that they have all the support and that uh, we maintain their quality of life or improve their quality of life. So how can we do that? Actually, this when we when I was given this topic, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I uh, the what the uh, 
organizers meant i will be able to cover or uh, uh, this is the one thing that they wanted me to speak but whatever i have found in my experience and whatever little literature i could get on that including pediatric psychology uh, psychiatry or so many things i have gone through i couldn't get any specific recommendations on this uh, on how to deal with that so but i think uh, with the practice of around 30 plus years maybe i can give justice to this so we have seen the exuberant adolescent coming with a, a menarche and the men are, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding or a concern about their irregular, uh, infrequent periods going into a, a pensive mood and finally into a state of depression. So, and that is an uh, adolescent basically, we all know, is a period of extreme turmoil and uh, they have a lot of problems with adjustment. So, and there is a lot of physical development going on, which they have to cope with. They have cognitive development, social, and then they have they are transforming from the childhood uh, fantasies into the uh, realities of adulthood, and that and they present to us quite often with a surprising and de a delightful combination of suddenly they'll blurt out some question without thinking about it. And then they'll be embarrassed and then they'll be confused and they'll have curiosity on their developing bodies. So this already has been told, but I would just like to say that the answer that is menarche is a memorable event in female adolescence. And these things have already been what is normal has already been dealt with by my previous speakers. And uh, probably what uh, I felt is there are a lot of myths and uh, the taboos in, in India regarding the uh, uh, menstruation and the, uh, so we, uh, slowly they are being removed and they are being um, uh, the, the girls have started coming out of all those taboos so hopefully uh, we should be able to talk more about periods so let us talk periods is a uh, is a movement which is there and so uh, with the pedia so the probably what the preparation for uh, all these things should come before the uh, she even comes to the us the obstetricians so the pediatricians also have an equal role so the they should be given an anticipatory guidance with regard to uh, water development so uh, regarding the menstruation and probably before they reach all that time so seven to eight years so maybe it's a little bit early, but still, I think that's the time we should go about it. So once they are educated about the normal range of acceptable, so the pattern of, uh, uh, as, uh, as it was in, uh, told before, the initial cycles may not be so regular as uh, anticipated. So that if once we explain to that, their worry and anxiety both for the uh, girl as well as the parents so very often we have seen in the opd it's a mother who comes running uh, either with uh, the complaint that she has infrequent periods or with heavy bleeding so once we have told them the uh, uh, facts or the normal things then probably that part of it could be alleviated and so uh, we as healthcare providers should normalize discussing menstrual uh, 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 what does that mean? Menstrual uh, we, we, menstruation with the uh, mother, parents, and the child. AUB happens to be one of the most common gynecological complaints in adolescents. And the presentation, as uh, the previous speakers were saying, it could be anything, but no, probably the most common are the heavy menstrual bleeding and infrequent periods. That's all I could get from the uh, some uh, some light on. So, but the problem is when the menstrual cycle becomes in unpredictable with presence of prolonged or and excessive flow, uh, or uh, when they become unpredictable, or if there is prolonged and excessive flow, it can be concern, uh, a concern. So that is a problem, and that becomes a stress. So, in our con uh, concept, at least regular menstrual cycle is an essential indicator of female adolescent health, but. That is what uh, it is there. But what is this regularity that has to be told? Because initially, as Dr. Mini has told, so uh, how, how frequently they should get periods, how many uh, days, and all those things, once we tell them, probably that psycho psychological stress that we are 
uh, that the girl and the parent uh, feels may be uh, elevated. So, so I think this was already been dealt. So the problem is that uh, as uh, so that is why most of the adolescents do not recognize their menstrual pro problems as treatable medical condition. They are in a phase of life where they are finding it difficult to talk with their parents. Probably they are talking among their peers, probably, and or to, uh, they can't talk with the parents or the teachers. They are uh, meaning uh, that is the age when they have, don't have that. Uh, 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 they don't have that, feel that freedom so they do not discuss the, uh, that their problems uh, um, with their healthcare providers as well unless we uh, uh, go for, uh, forth and ask them so only and only a few uh, it is surprising that only a few studies have investigated the quali quality of life of adolescents with menstrual disorders in fact i found a, a study in a journal called blood which is not our, uh, um, uh, meaning it's not an obstetric or a, a journal at all. And adolescents often feel depressed, helpless, and worried when they are faced with a, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding. So that requires surgeon management. As the previous speakers have told, definitely we need to stop the bleeding. We need to uh, resume the menstrual, regular menstrual cycles. And uh, uh, may, probably we may have to go on a long-term this thing, uh, treatment. But what about her quality of life? So that also needs, as we have said, uh, the heavy menstrual bleeding is something which disrupts the physical, social, emotional, and or material. So we have to think about the quality of life of the girl as well. So uh, there is no standard gu guideline as to how to go about that. But uh, we each go as the uh, as we need to go as per the situation requires. So this is a woe of the teenage years when they can't have fun with their parents, they can't talk to the parents, and there are uh, the other parents at the other extreme when they said that it's okay, it is something to <laughs> do with your teenage years. You are that is why you are thinking that okay, you are having problems. Or even there are uh, mothers who go with the Google and then give them their own treatment. So, uh, and a lot of teenagers also Google and find and worry about polycystic ovarian syndrome and other things. So, we need to talk to them about the uh, about the uh, um, regularity or about the menstruation or the heavy menstrual bleeding and how we are going to go about it. So. Uh, the, what is the problem when they even with the normal menstruation a third of the adolescents have da restricted daily activities during the menstruation probably because of uh, dysmenorrhea and uh, and they lose out on their school days so and another thing is when they have a heavy menstrual bleeding they are so tired that they miss out on school days as well as on physical activities dance classes, their uh, arts festivals, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, patients who come to us for, uh, with all these problems in our OPDs. So, they, um, so at least um, there are a lot of patients who uh, uh, miss out at least a day in a month. And uh, so socially and uh, with their peers, they are uh, uh, standing away or they are left out. So that causes a lot of stress, stress because they have um, they couldn't participate in the educational, physical, sports activities. They couldn't do uh, follow their hobbies. Probably they want to go trekking. They want to go, uh, meaning mountain climbing. Maybe something like that. They want to do that, which they cannot do do uh, because of the heavy menstrual bleeding and. When they are ab uh, absent in the school, that may affect their academic achievement as well. So uh, overall, when you think about the quality of life, where young people may miss school, so that is a, a, a sort of repetition. But what I wanted to stress was when there is a heavy menstrual bleeding, in a situation where the adolescent has limited access to menstrual hygiene products or to clean uh, water, uh, as happens many a time in India, even in our Kerala also, in schools, if you ask about the, the girls about a clean water or a clean uh, access to uh, where they can change their uh, pads or all those things, that also 
uh, um, uh, uh, may affect their education. So once there is heavy bleeding, they probably prefer to go not to go to school rather than uh, uh, go and then have a problem. So and then they, that may affect their health also. So many parts of rural India improvise menstrual health. Now the situation is changing, definitely, definitely. But still, there are still areas where they may use uh, improvised health materials, which can lead to, uh, for a long period of time, that can affect their uh, uh, health. And uh, when there is excess bleeding, they can have iron deficiency, anemia, and fatigue, which will affect their overall um, uh, performance. And uh, when they have, uh, they may, because during this period, they may have uh, to endure discomfort, te teasing, and other shaming. Uh, and because of, because of fear of leaks, then they may even they may not be able to wear the clothes that they would like to do in during those period days. So there are a lot of things, but things are changing. Our kids are becoming more uh, aware and more care, meaning they are exploring more areas, uh, more uh, ways in which to overcome all this. So the I think heavy menstrual bleeding already. Doctor Mini has told the. Uh, this is how you diagnose heavy menstrual bleeding and that is one of the common uh, things that uh, uh, see. So once there is heavy menstrual bleeding, the one thing I want to say is, uh, of course, the evaluation, I think somebody told. So uh, the, pro the, the most important thing is if you want to her to come back to you with a problem, meaning to uh, open up again, you need to put her at ease. So when you are taking a history, probably she may not like her mother to be there. Uh, or she may want her mother to be there. So depending on her uh, will or her wish, so you can, uh, you should uh, adapt the situation. So when when you are talking, we want to talk about whether, uh, her sexual activity or something like that. Probably it would be uh, wise or to um, um, ask her mother to be uh out outside or some um, to remain outside meaning like to avoid her mother to being there and uh, if uh, you are um, want more details sometimes the girls may not be willing to open up so probably the parents help may need to be taken so uh, same way examination uh, and you can ask the uh, work with the girl because that is how you build a rapport very often we in our BCOPD we don't have time to build a rapport. So work we can work with the patient to map out a careful history. They may have a menstrual uh, app or something menstrual. So, so we need to know is she really having a heavy menstrual bleeding. So and in examination also we don't need uh, that detail. Probably we need a more detailed physical examination, a thorough systemic examination, all those things. And uh, you can uh, having her mother with her with her with at her side may be uh, comfort more comfortable for a girl, especially I think probably in Indian situation that might be more comfortable for her. And so uh, and whenever we are recommending a, a test, uh, as Dr. Mini had said, so many indications for doing tests, uh, we need to make sure that it is uh, uh, there is no emotional or financial burden to the patient. And as uh, the previous speaker said, uh, said, the basic approach to treatment is to stop the bleeding, treat the anemia, ensure a regular menstrual cycle, but very, very important, increase the quality of life of the adolescent. This was the uh, uh, um, study which I had um, um, had seen in one of the um, journals. And that is um, actually... Um, that was it was a retrospective study and they have evaluated the uh, severe um, depression scale using the um, um, health score and they have found that um, quality of health, um, health health questionnaire that is a phq9 and they have found that there is a significant association between heavy menstruation and the moderate to severe depression but uh, as they have given a, a um, postscript-like thing, 
they have said that the adolescents are definitely at the age when you have other reasons for depression. But in, in this study, they have not been able to find a causal relationship, but probably that is worth looking into. So we need to, uh, we know the girls are very cranky. They have, they have premenstrual uh, problems. They have, uh, they are more irritable. They are sad. They are all those things during the menstrual. So just imagine the girl who is having bleeding for 10, 15 days. How will she feel? So uh, that is uh, the, psycho so the debilitating psychosocial implications are often overlooked and neglected when we uh, focus on only restoring, restoring the normal menstrual cycle. So remember, most teenagers are busy worrying about fitting in and juggling school and extracurricular responsibility. And they are in, under a lot of stress otherwise. So we should not put it to them to manage their abnormal uterine bleeding. So we should make them comfortable so that they can follow their uh, peers and they can be with their peers even during the um, menstruation, uh, even with the menstrual irregularities. So we should be uh, um, supportive of them and we should make the treatment such that they can be, uh, um, um, they can follow their life uh, normally. So we should give emotional support to the young adolescent and uh, so that they, they will return and we should uh, ensure that we have a strong physician-patient relationship. So that's what I was saying. They should come back to us if they have a problem so that we can hold an open and honest conversation. So And it's so, uh, it's so uh, gratifying when they finally uh, uh, get some relief from their problems and that now uh, helping them to navigate those gynecological problems is extremely extremely gra um, gratifying and that can come only from by a healthy relationship by uh, by a from with a trusted clinician you need to be, make uh, yourself into a uh, their friend so another problem which they often come with is a, an infrequent period which may be associated with PCO. I'm not going into too much about PCO or body image and hirsutism and other things because that's not our topic today. But it was found that oligomenorrhea was associated. I know that term should not be used, but that was associated with PCO and they are found to have higher levels of anxiety and depression and lower psychosocial scores. The only thing they have is probably their physical functioning is okay, but their overall uh, psychological uh, score is uh, meaning uh, less. They have more of depression, anxiety, uh, problems with body image, anxiety about whether they are going to have fertility problems and so on and so forth. So when you see all these, we know that early intervention and treatment should be uh, done so that we can prevent them from going into depression the anxiety is okay but then we can probably um, uh, we should try to make them improve their psychosocial course goals so uh, to just uh, to conclude the impact of menstrual problem on education among uh, adolescents is very significant and as we saw there is a lot of problems like abstinence and not go, I meaning school abstinence and disability to concentrate on studies etc cetera, etc cetera. and once they start at school they can continue unchanged throughout life so they don't feel like going for uh, to school means then they have problem with going we, we see quite a lot of pay, uh, girls who say okay i don't go on the first day of uh, periods but that can go on in their further life because that will uh, reduce their uh, if, efficiency when they join work so it's important that uh, they sh that these problems especially the psychological aspect of it should be addressed properly from the very beginning and uh, uh, parents and teachers should have knowledge about uh, menstruation and the, they should act like uh, friends for the girls and uh, helping and uh, as clinicians we need to incorporate the psych psycho emotional aspects into routine care of adolescents with menstrual disorders so our young people are assets to be cultivated and nurtured let's begin treating them that way i don't know whether i have uh, been able to cover what the organizers wanted me to say uh, thank you so much for including me in this uh, program and uh, thank you for your patient listening thank you so much
Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, you were the right person to deal that topic that we often ignore. And it is the need of the hour to understand not only the physical aspect, but also the mental aspect. And with the beautiful slides and all the detailed um, knowledge that you have shared, it was a beautiful session. And I know that everybody would have uh, really benefited from that. Thank you so much, madam. I now request Dr. Ajit sir, our moderator, to give his expert opinion about each of the topics discussed. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Subna. Anyway, it was uh, wonderful to hear uh, the speakers. Very informative talk, starting from Dr. Mini discussing about AUB, adolescent AUB. The Dr. Piyadarsini on the treatment the surgical management, even though we rarely we do a surgery for an adolescent AUB. Then the most important thing is the psychological aspect, which is well covered by Dr. Yitira. Uh, adolescent AUB, the main issue is most of the time, Mr. Dr. Gita, can you stop sharing? Yeah, I think else? I have. I have stopped sharing, Ajit. Uh, I think Sapna, this is Sapna, Sapna screen. Sapna, can you? Yes, sir. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, it's causing, it can cause a lot of psychological problems for the, the girl. And not only to the girl, the more worried is the mother. Yes. So the most important thing is we have to give counsel the mother and give adequate support to the, 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 the girl as well as to the mother. Then... The most important cause of AUB, as Dr. Mini told us, is the ovulatory problem. But we should not neglect a hematological problem, especially if, if it is starting from anarchy. Then if she is having other bleeding problems, or if there is a family history of bleeding problem, definitely we, we need to go for a hematological investigation. The simple thing we do is a APTT, PTINR, and a complete blood count at a peripheral smear. And even if necessary, a one will be factor or resuscitant factor. That is all we, we need to do. Then the endocrine problem, thyroid problem, we have to consider. Then rarely only uh, examine. If it is a refractory thing, we need to go for a uh, examination and anesthesia and a surgical problem. Uh, the unfortunately, the problem is the moment a girl is having an AUB, she will undergo a scan. And then she will come up with a report that it is a PCO and label it as PCO. Oh. Uh, and even the mother will be saying that my my girl is having, my daughter is having PCO. Uh, and the every treatment is on PCOS. And lean girl may be undergoing a lot of lifestyle modification, uh, so-called all these things. Uh, one thing I think is uh, we are abusing this ultrasound. We are not supposed to do an ultrasound. Only in indicated cases, we, uh, we should go for an ultrasound. Otherwise, it can cause a lot of psychological issues to the, the girl also. Then, about the treatment, most of the cases, mild cases, with the reassurance and tranexamic acid can be controlled. And if it is, the next step is, especially if it is an ovulatory disorder, we go for a progesterone. Not not the combined pill or estrogen or anything. Because I have never used IV estrogen. It's not available and it's not recommended also. Uh, the, the one is uh, the one simple thing is uh, go for a progesterone. Uh, the most uh, useful one is a norethisterone because it is more hemostatic than other meprate and all these things. So the, at least in the first cycle, go for the, the norethisterone. And then cyclical progesterone is uh, or a combined pill is all that is okay. Then where comes the role of estrogen? Especially if, if it is uh, not responding to progesterone or when you do a scanning, if the endometrium is very thin, then the role of estrogen comes. As Dr. Priyadrasini told us, the best thing is start with a combined pill. Combined pill, every sixth hourly we can give till the bleeding stops. And then you reduce the dose and taper it over a period of 21 days. And then you can uh, treat with a cyclical combined pill. The issue with the combined pill, again, the mother may not accept the combined pill. So cyclical progesterone is uh, the best thing. Yeah? If it is, uh, uh, if it is no, if she is not responding to cyclical progesterone, then we go for a 
come back. Uh, then again, if it is a severe bleeding, there is a place for giving IV tranexamic acid. IV tranexamic acid, one gram we can give and can repeat it. That is an acute AUB. You can give it. These are some of the points <laughs> that came and to Dr. Ajit, and Dr. Priyadarshini, you had said the dosage is 600, maximum only 600 milligram IV. Is it like that? I don't know. So is it a one gram? One gram. Uh -huh. He said the mm. maximum to be given is 600 milligram per dose. Because uh, I don't think giving one, one gram. per dose. Per dose. Yeah, IV we can give gram. up to one. IV we can give up to one gram. Okay. I thought it was uh, IV that you said it is 600. So that is why I had a doubt. Yeah. Thank Even you. Even for the, the oral also, uh, the dose that is given most of the time is very inadequate. We, we have to go for a higher dose. Uh, a 500 to 1300 milligram. You can give thrice daily. Unfortunately, what is happening is most of the time we combine it with the methamphetamine as a traffic we give, uh, which is expensive and less effective. So the best thing is give tranexamic acid plain uh, a higher dose. And if she is having pain also, you can uh, along with that you can give a separate tablet of methamphetamine acid. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, uh, I have some uh, uh, questions to ask. One is to Dr. Kirti. Uh, regarding the excision of this non-communicating cavities, how often uh, you have seen during the histopathological examination uh, situation of uh, cystic adenomyosis? Because there are few papers telling uh, very often these uh, histopathological reports come as a cystic adenomyosis and it is more common than we expect. What is your experience? Unmute. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So the video that I had shared, I had actually taken the specimen and cut it. If I can actually uh, share a screen share, I can show you the picture of the histopathology. Can I? Okay, you just said, what is your experience with the yeah. histopathology? So what happens is always when it is an acum that we suspect, it's important that we cut and we open it. If it's a cavity, it will be very, very small. It's not that it will be very large because even when it's very small, the, the patients, the adolescent girls can come with these symptoms. But what happens is because the pressure is more, the surrounding tissue will look like that of adenomyosis. See, because the cavity pressure is there. You are speaking about the situation when the histopathology report comes, it comes as cystic adenomyosis, but yes. the preoperative diagnosis always we make it as a non-communicating uh, uh, rudimentary horn. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the report when it uh, histopathology comes, I also came across few situations mm -hmm. uh, because the reports coming as cystic adenomyosis. That's cystic what adenomyosis. It. because mm -hmm. it's very important that we actually tell to the pathologist also means it can be these are the two differential diagnoses. Either it can be an acume. Or it can be cystic adenomyosis, wherein there are multiple spaces seen. So what would be better is they the pathologist actually saying an acume is very rare. They won't usually comment on an acume. Might be uh, the lack of uh, uh, awareness that an acume yeah. is Maybe there. Lack of awareness. Acume yeah. is uh, actually is coming up as a new thing, bro. Yeah. So uh, when always... I actually told the pathologist they were actually reading about acum and then they came to okay, fine, this is something like you know this can happen, and I shared the image also. So they actually saw a small cavity, very small, but a small cavity. And unlike that of cystic adenomyosis, there'll be multiple small uh, cystic yeah, in, in cystic adenomyosis, the myometrium will be invaded with uh, endometrial tissues yes. specifically. And that can be seen easily on uh, histopathology. Yes. Uh, even if they are aware, these findings uh, easily differentiate it from the cystic adenomyosis. And uh, second thing, uh, in what all situation, can you briefly, because you showed a myomectomy of a patient uh, who is not an adolescent. Yeah. So uh, how, uh, uh, in what all situations do you suggest uh, myomectomy in adolescent girl? Uh, medically managed and still doesn't work and hemoglobin drop is there and still, you know, you try with all uh, iron supplementation and it still doesn't work and it's actually affecting the quality of life of the girl in spite of medically management still doesn't work, then only we'll go for an option of a surgical. Uh, what about uh, selective embolization? I wouldn't actually suggest. for I 
No, uh, it's not the autoimmune embolization. It's uh, the embolization of only the feeding vessel to that particular myeloma. Yes, because uh, we cannot actually, that's undergoing a procedure. Cost-wise also, it's almost, I think, uh, the same. But the thing is, uh, you're not completely sure there can be degenerative changes also. It might be effective. But when we actually go in for a surgery, there can be degenerative changes and to actually enucleate it completely also will become difficult for the surgeon who is doing it. Yeah, because, because it may affect because, the ovarian blood supply also, you know. No, no, no. Selective embolization, yes, yes. that will not affect even, the even, ovarian Only blood. the feeding. Uh, even only the, the vessel which is giving to the myoma. And uh, see, very often, because these things can be suggested, because very often, even if it is our daughter or sister, when somebody says a surgery, yes. the first our response is to avoid surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's why I just asked about it. And next query is to Dr. Priyadarshini. See, uh, you said uh, most of the uh, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding can be due to anovulation. Why can't we give letrozol rather than giving uh, tons and kilos of positives, estrogens, progesterone? Why don't you give letrozol? Yeah, letrozol is effective actually. Um, but in adolescent age group, I don't know. Uh, because even whether you give no, letrozol... Without, you... monit without monitoring, you cannot say that it is ineffective. Because cause of abnormal uterine bleeding in anovulatory AUB is anovulation, uh -huh. isn't it? Yeah. So you may ovulate her with the letter saw, give five days, monitor her, whether she is ovulating or not. But then why, why, is there any need? Because if we wait for some time, she's naturally her, as her hypothalamus pituitary axis matures. No, no, she is bleeding. She, she is bleeding and you are uh, unnecessarily giving estrogens, OCPs, uh, so many things. No, it's a curry. It's a uh, rational thing. I understand, but she, days, if she is bleeding, if bleeding yeah, is... If she is coming for infertility treatment, definitely we'll consider No, 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 no. <laughs> See, this she is, is not infertility. She, we are correcting an ovulation because other girls who are ovulating, they are not having menorrhagia. This uh, unfortunate girl who is not ovulating, that's why she is having this menorrhagia. You make her ovulate rather than giving estrogens. Two things comes when... Uh, see, when hey, it may work in one cycle. What about the next cycle? No, no, no. See, you, uh, OCP also you are giving multiples of cycles. That's that all you give it. Where are the side effects, no? We don't know the long-term effect of... No, you compare the long-term effect of letrosol. No, no, you compare the letrosol versus the OCP, which is having... Uh, do you think anything is having no side effect? Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, there, yeah. there are a lot of studies yeah. happening. That's why I just asked. How, no, how earlier, Rajan taking? sir also, uh, our uh, previous Cotton uh, Medical College professor, Dr. R. Rajan, also used to say about the such treatment, like CERM and all like that. Yeah, it is coming back because recently there is a study from China that is there uh, suggesting this <laughs> instead of OCPs. <laughs> no, no, we cannot just ignore yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, the phone yeah, yeah. using is made from China only. <laughs> and the third third part, uh, Dr. Gida, do yeah. the doctors, being the doctors, do we have the right to tell the girls, you get married as soon as possible, you get pregnant, all your stories, uh, all your illness will end. I have seen many doctors tell the uh, adolescent girls or maybe 20s or something, you get married, uh, you get pregnant, all your uh, abnormal bleeding, all PCOS or endometriosis, everything will get solved. What is your psychological opinion about that? No, I think personally, we don't have any right to do that. It's their personal thing. Yeah, and, it's a message uh, for everybody. Yeah, that this is not yeah that. because uh, um, and uh, doesn't say that if we, if she gets married, her endometriosis or whatever is going to di uh, disappear. So this is like saying that uh, epilepsy will disappear once they get married or whatever. That is not going to do work. So we need to tell them that uh, the facts, meaning like uh, the treatment has already been uh, told by the others. So, but our uh, part should be that we tell them the um, scientific part and then let them take the decision. We cannot uh, force anything on them. Ajit, I am correct, no? We have seen no? many people, many, many yeah, of us. I agree. I, I agree the Punyamaydin, that many people do that. But you ask my uh, opinion, I don't do that. No, I think that should be the opinion and uh, we should not do it. We don't have any right to tell them because uh, it is their own personal right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, um, you have to say. 
because uh, psychological counseling very important because uh, I will tell you about two patients who has come today. One was an adolescent AUB who has been bleeding and her mother has shown to a doctor. The doctor immediately wrote a routine investigation along with they asked them to do a scan and then you and an urine pregnancy test. And then suddenly they came from there to me and they said oh, the doctor has written a urine pregnancy test. So this is the first case and then I counseled her about the importance and then I uh, uh, make them understand what is the need. So the second patient uh, came with um, from the urologist because they expected some, she's an again unmarried girl and uh, she came from, uh, she was referred from uh, the urology department because they thought that she is having pain and it is because of some ureteric calculation. And now uh, they came to me and they do did they have done an ultrasound. It shows mild hemoperitoneum. She is an unmarried girl, hemoperitoneum. And now I am going to operate on her. Now, uh, this hemoperitoneum, so what I did, I did uh, a serum uh, beta HCG, then TSH, RBS, everything. Now the beta HCG is 8,500. So the counseling part is very important because uh, one person might be afraid of beta HCG, but sometimes we may land up in trouble. So uh, I didn't mention UPT. I did a uh, beta HCG and the, along with the routine blood test. So this is how it goes oh, over to Sopna. Thank you, all the uh, speakers. Wonderful uh, slides and uh, wonderful thoughts that uh, really they have done very well. Thank you all. There are there are a few questions to Dr. Priyadar Sini. One is uh, Tranexa maximum dose IV and oral. I think she told us. Yes. The next question is. Uh, when we give OCP to recognize three, for three to six months, and then we stop, the patient continues to have irregular or long heavy bleeding. What is your further management? He will let us coming up in the panel now. <laughs> he will let us all. <laughs> so don't expect so the, the cycles to be regular, uh, regularized with your OCP, isn't it? Uh, it's only a, uh, just a treatment for three to months. But again, a cyclical progesterone can be given till the hypothalamus pituitary get recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking up the questions. And it was so nice to hear from Ajit, sir, his pearls of wisdom. It was really the icing of cake and it's given us the practical points, the correct dosage, how to go about it. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Kunimoidin, sir, as your vision is nexus. You have put all the thinking caps on and we are thinking about letrozole. And I think we can take up research as so. well. I don't know, but yeah, yeah research but committee will do <laughs> so many researches. Like uh, his vision, nexus, like he wants us all to think more about something not uh, the routine path, but something uh, not away from the routine. Thank it's you so a much. Man of ideas, interesting, actually. <laughs> yeah, interesting uh, discussion. Now let's go. Um, and I want to thank each and every uh, uh, speech, uh, speech given by every uh, talk. Who, it was excellent. So now we go to the second session. It's a panel discussion, case by case, a panel which is going to deep dive deep into adolescent case scenarios. So we have a array of stars of panelists who is going to be moderated by none other than Dr. Suchitra Sudhir Madam and Dr. Mini Madam. And we have panelists, Dr. Tulsi Devi, who is a senior consultant, Raja Hospital Chavakar. And we all know her. She's a star of k Hub. Dr. Smithy George, Senior Consultant and Laparoscopic Surgeon, Cooperative Hospital, Kakanar, Past Secretary of Cochin OBG Society, and she was also the Adolescent Committee Chairperson, KFOG, 2019-2022. We have with her Dr. Anjana Varier, who is our dear, she's my, from my Palakkad, and she's a Consultant and Lab Surgeon of Rajiv Gandhi Cooperative Hospital, an excellent dancer. Dr. Bindu S. Madan, Senior Consultant in Alwa. She's a present Angamali Society Secretary and she's a very good uh, friend and well wisher of ours. Dr. Uh, Preeta George Madam, she's an Associate Professor, Colin Jerry Medical College, past Secretary of MOGS. She's published various uh, papers and her areas of interest is oncology. Thank you and over to you, Suchitra Madam and Mini Madam, and best of luck to all the panelists. Good evening, all. We'll going. We'll be going to the adolescent AUB case scenario discussion. Sopna will try to do the screen sharing. Uh, beautiful, uh, all my dear beautiful panelists, Doctor Tolasi, Doctor Anjana, Doctor Smithy, Doctor Pintu, and Doctor Priya. 
Preetha. All my dear friends, we'll start case by case. So as an introduction part, we know that the incidence of pubertal uh, menstrual bleeding is around 40% in adolescent. And out of the 40%, Madam, can you see the slides, Madam? It, yeah, it's coming up. Next okay. slide. So um, I have to, Madam, you will have to say to just move on, uh, like the next slide, when you want. Yeah, first slide. Okay. So all the societies are being represented in this panel. They are all ready. So, so adolescent, it is the, we know that the incidence of puberty and uh, menstrual bleeding is around 40%. And out of this, uh, 40%, 20% have got uh, bleeding disorders like von Willebrand's or platelet function defects or thrombocytopenia or clotting factors. Next. <laughs> Next. Next. And next one. So normal cycle, we all know the menarche is mean age is around 20.3 years. And uh, the mean cycle interval is 32.2 in the first year. Menstrual cycle interval is between 21 to 45 days. And menstrual flow length is less than 7 days. The menstrual product used around 3 to 6 pads or tablets. And when we can, when we do it, it is heavy menstrual headache. It is when the packs are soft or the tampons in one hour for two to three hours in a row or causing clots more than one inch in diameter or using double protection like pad plus tampon or two pads together or flushing or gushing sensation or frequent accidents or leaking through protection or even diagnosed with anemia. Next. So, abnormal. Next. Abnormal uterine bleeding is actually in adults and is that we to the category of A, U, B, O. So the most common cause of AUB is anovulation. Secondary to the disturbance of normal hypothalamus, pituitary, ovarian axis, which we all know. Next. And next. AUB is ACOG consider AUB synonymous with anovulatory ovulation cycle. Next. So the physiology, actually we know that the anovulation is proportionate to the uh, age at menarche. Anovulation is because of the immaturity of hypothalamus, pituitary ovary in axis. And uh, in the first post menarche year, it is around 50% will be anovulated. So, this next, this is a pictorial representation that is the hypothalamus, pituitary ovary in axis. Without ovulation, why the basis is that without ovulation, there won't be any progesterone. So, the endometrium has underposed estrogen, which will thick which get thickened until it must plug. And endometrium become excessively muscular without an adequate stromal support. And this will lead to fragile and irregular endometrial bleeding. And that is the basis of anovulatory bleeding. Next. Next. So next will be the we'll be starting the case discussion. This is a 17 year old girl who has come with history of profuse bleeding for the last 10 days. She attained menarche at 15 years of age, irregular bleeding once in 10 days. She complains of tiredness, instability, and inability to concentrate. Further blood investigations has revealed a normal thyroid prolactin and coagulation profile. So Dr. Anjana, what is this classification like? How are you going to proceed? Yes, thank you, madam. So, uh, nice. she's nice to meet you, madam. Yeah. So, first, our uh, first. Next slide. So, our first question is how severe is her condition? Now, what is the severity of her AUB? So, uh, this is the classification, severity classification, which is into mild, moderate, and severe. And uh, mild, mild AUB is a longer duration more than seven days or shorter cycles that is less than three weeks that too for two months in succession consecutive two months with slightly or moderately increased bleeding but usually in such cases the hemoglobin levels are usually normal or mildly decreased that is it it's always around uh, 10 to 12 or sometimes more than 12 whereas in moderate cases moderate prolonged or frequent bleeding which is every one to three weeks 
with moderate to heavy bleeding and the hemoglobin is usually between uh, 10 and 12. And in severe conditions, there is heavy bleeding and always usually the hemoglobin level is less than 10. So how are you going to evaluate further? Next slide. So our evaluation always begins with proper history taking and examination before proceeding into investigations. But always keep in mind, like Sujitra Madam just pointed out now, always rule out pregnancy, even if it is an unmarried girl, adolescent or uh, whether she gives or doesn't give history anything suggestive to look for pregnancy do a upt or a serum beta hcg rule out pregnancy before you proceed to other uh, evaluation for other causes of aub Next and as we know the most common cause is uh, uh, anovulation more than 50 percent cases it is anovulatory aub and the second most common Cause, which comes around 20% is bleeding disorders among these uh, age groups. So after pregnancy, rule out bleeding disorders, then always look for other uh, rarer causes like trauma or uh, iatrogenic or due to any previous medications and rarely like structural causes, which has already been discussed and even PCOS. So, so coming to, uh, yes. How will we try it? Next slide. Yes, our initial, uh, as, as we have already discussed, our first thing is to assess the hemodynamic stability of the patient. See, monitor her vitals, see if she is hemodynamically stable or not. And if you find that she is hemodynamically unstable, she needs immediate hospitalization before you initiate any evaluation, stabilize her, and then further proceed to evaluation of uh, AUB. And suppose she's hemodynamically stable, we can manage her on an OP basis, rule out pregnancy, as we've already said. And if it is negative, you go into evaluation of other causes of AUB. So how are you going to manage this case? Next slide. Yes. So we always begin with proper history taking. History begins with you know, her age of, um, her menstrual history, start with age of menarche, her regularity, duration of flow, number of pads and all this history. But one thing I would like to stress that uh, Geeta Madam has already pointed out, always take history with and without the presence of parents. They might reveal something more when they uh, uh, find uh, when they are they feel they feel safe to confide in you. So always take history with and without the presence of parents. And in the coming to next important thing you need to look for is uh, you ask for is her medical history. Ask for any recent illnesses, any recent medications, any underlying systemic illness, and so on and history of any previous surgeries or any procedures, ask specifically whether there was any uh, bleeding in association with the surgery or any uh, minor procedures like dental procedures. And, and history of so, frequent yeah, bruising, yeah, yeah. epistaxis, yes. all those yes. things. For looking out for the uh, bleeding Next. disorders. Yes. yes. Next, <clears throat> Next coming to, yes, and Next. another important thing is, as for family history of similar illness and coming to examination part, look at the uh, uh, general examination, look for pallor, look for epitic or echimotic patches, which are indicators pointing towards some bleeding disorders. Look for thyroid enlargement and look for any mass per abdomen and local examination as uh, Ajit sir had pointed out. Local examination, only when you are, especially in uh, uh, adolescent age group, when you are in doubt, never hesitate to go for a local examination under anesthesia. But we'll, uh, we can postpone it until a trial of medical therapy has, has been given. And when there is no response, uh, go for a local examination under anesthesia. What is the, how are we going to manage this case? Next slide. Next two slides. So a go the goal of management for an adolescent right. AUB is always provide hemodynamic stability, control the bleeding, correct anemia, and maintain normal cycles. So as Priyadarshini Madam has discussed beautifully, um, 
in mild cases uh, just antifibrinolytics is good enough but in our patient she has uh, bleeding every 10 uh, every 10 days lasting for uh, 10 days and from history she has a history of uh, fatigability lack of concentration all pointing towards anemia so for her the best treatment option would be to start her on cocs um, and if she is actively bleeding start her on COCs uh, fourth or sixth hourly until the bleeding stops and then taper the drug to uh, once daily dosage and then continue along with it supply hematinix iron tablet uh, 60 milligram per day and for uh, you know not not this case but in uh, when she has she has mild AUB, you can think of just tranexamic acid alone. And even when cases where estrogen is contraindicated, like patients with uh, migraine with aura, prior DVT, or adolescents who have uh, other issues which lead them to an immobilized state, in such cases, it is better you avoid estrogen. So in such patients, you can think of giving cyclical progestins. That ends the first case because this is a normal uh, case of AUB which present to us usually. And depending upon the severity, we have to manage the case. Over to Sujitra, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, unmute. Hello, good evening. Uh -huh. Evening. Very beautiful to see all five stars from the different societies. And here I have a case for Bindu, a 13-year-old girl who attained Menaki. 13-year-old girl who attained Menaki five months back comes with history of heavy menstrual bleeding since the last two cycles. How can she be evaluated and managed? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so she's only 13 and she is in the first year of her menstrual period, so only one year. Uh, so uh, she has to be uh, most probably it's in the she is in the transit period. So we, we have most probably it will be due to immaturity of the hypothalamus due to ovarian axis. So probably over ovulatory it will be an anovulatory dysfunction. But before uh, saying it as an anomalous dysfunction, you have to go, go through uh, differential diagnosis, uh, many other processes. So there are so many differential diagnoses for this case. Uh, it may be most probably in the in this girl, we have to look for coagulopathies, especially von Willebrand's disease, which is a common thing uh, in this adolescent girls. And even platelet dysfunction, platelet dysfunctions, uh, and then coagulating factor deficiencies, etc. And uh, um, some dental system, as Kirti said, uh, some dental system abnormal pathologies like uh, polyps, myomas, even adenomyosis, and uh, cervical dysplasias, and all other things we have to rule out. And even infections also, infection, dental tract infections, we have to rule out uh, like uh, um, gonorrhea, syphilis, etc. A lot of infections are there. We have to rule out that. And important thing is don't forget about pregnancy and its related complication. It may be an incomplete abortion. Uh, it may be an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, it may be an inflammation bleeding or something like that. We have to rule out all those things. And uh, coming to endocrine causes also, we have to rule out hyperprolactinemia, thyroid dysfunction, adrenal diseases, PCOS, etc. And don't forget about genital trauma in this era. Uh, she may be sexually abused. So we have to rule out that also. Uh, and uh, sometimes a foreign may be a foreign body may be seen in the vagina, uh, which may be the cause for this bleeding, and uh, rule out that some lacerations to the fall or something like that. She may hide that, uh, and drugs 
drugs also cause these problem, uh, problems like this, uh, that is anticoagulants, antipsychotics, uh, platelet inhibitors, etc. And uh, some, uh, important one is stress. As Gita Madam told, stress is an important uh, one. Uh, it may present like this later, or excessive exercise and eating disorders like anorexia nervosa or bulimia, etc. also present like this. So these are the differential diagnoses. Hmm. And okay, thank uh, you, Bindu. Now, yes. you, uh, what are the di diagnostic evaluation for this patient? You'll do. What are the yes, things that you? So uh, even though she is thirty, investigations the, the priority uh, priorities for pregnancy test only, ma'am, in this era. Uh, so most probably uh, we will do a beta HCG along with the other blood investigation that complete uh, blood count. Peripheral smear is must because sometimes uh, some leukemias may present like this. So per, uh, along with CBC, we have to do a peripheral smear, thyroid function test, prolactin, uh, and if there is headache or vision disturbances or anything like that. Most important one is uh, to rule out coagulation disorders, at least prothrombin type, APTT, they have to be done. And sometimes factor, uh, uh, coagulation factors can be analyzed and I look for uh, screen for uh, STS, HIE, HDS, AD, VDR, etc. If there is clinical features of hyperandrogenism, we can investigate for her for PCOS also. And ultrasound is also uh, maybe needed to roll out these uh, structural anomalies like that. If it is a case of bleeding disorder that you are suspecting, what all will you do? How will you approach the patient? So uh, we have to uh, ask for history. In the history, uh, especially family history. Uh, so history, we have to take in detail, especially history of bruises, repeated bruises. Uh, heavy bleeding during uh, epistasis, uh, then gum bleeding or excessive bleeding during dental procedures, etc. We have to take that history. And uh, as I already uh, told, the complete blood count uh, and APTT, prothrombin time, uh, five, uh, clotting factors estimation, and one millibran factor we can assess. All these things we have to do. And also uh, RFT, LFT, and all that. Yes, yes, RFT, LFT. And uh, to assess the severity of anemia, we have to do ferritin estimation, uh, fiber, uh, fiber nodule, etc. We have to do uh, function. And platelet function tests also, uh, not usually done, but we can do that also. Then, uh, uh, if you find that the girl is very anemic, how will you correct yes, the anemia? Yes. Uh, as Anjana already told, the uh, first thing we have to see is whether the patient is stable or hemodynamically stable or not. So, uh, um, we have to, uh, the, our goal should be, uh, to our first, first goal should be the, to maintain the hemodynamic stability. Then, so, uh, second one is to correct the anemia, acute or chronic anemia, we have to correct it. And the third goal is to return to a normal menstrual cycle pattern. Uh, and then we have to prevent the recurrence of these symptoms like this. Uh, and last one is uh, to avoid long-term consequences of anovulation. This is the goal for our management. So. We can correct uh, depending upon the severity of anemia. Uh, as she, uh, Angela already told, it, uh, sometimes it will be mild, moderate, severe, etc. So, mild cases we can give a uh, simple oral iron, 60 milligram per day is enough. Uh, in moderate cases, around 10 milligram, we can give uh, 60 milligram twice a day. But in severe cases, uh, she may need blood transfusion. To correct, uh, correct the pitch, etc. 
supplement uh, oral supplements can be given to child and because of uh, uh, look for bleeding music we can give and also ask us to have a good ministry calendar to have yeah. Uh, if it is mild cases, we can ask her to put menstrual calendars. And uh, if it is a, if she is bleeding heavily, uh, even though estrogen, uh, estrogen is not available, we can give her OCPs. Uh, as the previous speakers or panelists already told, we can give OCPs. Uh, sixth hourly high dose piece to control the bleeding. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as Adisa told, uh, norepistrogram is more effective than combined hospice to control the acute bleeding. And uh, to relieve the pain, we can do prostaglant uh, dismethanomic acid, and along with the transient acid, can be given. Uh, actually, I when we give um, uh, the severe bleeding, estrogen may have a healing effect upon the endometrium. Yes, so we so cannot completely uh, uh, It's not. Uh, it's not available. We can. It, not available, but estrogen. Uh, our OC pills can be given. And combined yes. pills can be given. Yes. Mini, Mini, are you there? Okay, now thank you so much, Bindu. Now we'll go on to the next uh, case that is uh, monitoring the response of adolescents who are being treated for anovulatory uterine bleeding. And uh, how will you ask them to monitor how they are going to keep the to keep track of their menstrual bleeding? ಈಸಿಲಿ record in those apps the beginning of the menstrual cycle and how many days it is being lasting and uh, what about uh, mild puberty menorrhagia how how do you classify the different types of menorrhagia in adolescents mild moderate or um, actively bleeding patient in mild puberty menorrhagia usually the hemoglobin will be almost normal or it is between 10 to 12 gram per deciliter so you can uh, keep a menstrual calendar on them and follow up in every three months if they have severe bleeding they have to supposed to report back and you have to repeat all the investigation that you have done whereas in moderate puberty menorrhagia hormonal therapy is the best so you can use either a progesterone like the norepinephrine or a combined also or, or combined oral contraceptive pills on those patients if the patient is heavily bleeding you can start her on the norepinephrine also then when the, when she's actively bleeding what will you combined estrogen progesterone oral contraceptive pills can be given or there is even we have we have started no epistron and uh, the good results have been uh, obtained you start with the maximum dose and slowly taper the dose micronized oral, oral progesterone is the preferred one because nowadays it's very clinically identical to endogenous progesterone okay and then now uh, what about counseling the patient as dr geeta was saying patients are very much upset especially adolescents yeah. so how will you counsel them ask them to take oral micronized progesterone 200 mg every night for the first 12 days of the calendar month 
because it's easy for them to follow it. And uh, one thing is that you have to tell them that this is not a method of contraception. And if at all they are sexually act active, it is better to replace it by combined oral contraceptive pills. They have, um, if they have unprotected sexual intercourse while using progesterone only therapy, emergency postcoital pills should be given. Okay, and coming to the, thank you so much, Prita. Thank coming you. to the next case, I think we'll go on to Dr. Smithy. 13 year old adolescent who attained Menaki six months ago comes with increased bleeding for the past 15 days associated with clots. And she says that she had similar episodes in the past three months and also gives history of slightly excessive bleeding during her tooth extraction one year ago and uh, her hemoglobin is low. It's only eight milligram per percent and thyroid profile is normal. Screening coagulation test reveal a normal platelet count. So, Dr. Smithy, what is the diagnosis and how will you present? Excuse me, you cannot see the screen. Uh, I don't know what's happened. It's too active. Should I put on the camera? I don't know why, why the screen is not seen on my so, Chitra, ma'am, can, can you see the slides? I, I can, can see, see the slides. slides. Um, what, what have I done? <laughs> switch to, I, I can see two icons. One is switch to cam, switch camera. When I'm tapping, that nothing is happening. And then there's switch to active speaker. So, maybe that is... Ah, now I can see the slides. Um, can okay. you see, madam? Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So, um... This is a phase three. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I can, see, I, I, can see, I can see the uh, screen now. So, this apparently looks mm -hmm. like one of those, you know, co coagulation profile problems because here she clearly says that she has a problem doing tooth, uh, tooth extraction and her hemoglobin has come down. That is, it is eight. And all our thyroid is normal and um, screening or uh, normal platelet, everything is normal. So we have to check out for von Willebrand's disease. First, you have to ask for a family history. And then she says that she has a problem of excess bleeding during the previous dental extraction. As also, she has bleeding which is more than normal. So for yeah. adolescents who present with heavy menstrual bleeding, of the 40% of adolescents, 40% adolescents do present with uh, uh, excess bleeding, of which 20 may be because of von Willebrand's disease. And uh, they have easy bruising and, you know, all those uh, things which indicate a problem with the uh, coagulation profile. So, uh, these, these are the indications of coagulopathy screening. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Then... Okay. Who to screen for bleeding disorders? I did, yeah. So screening, uh, apparently, we have to see, see suppose a patient, as, as in this patient, if there's a family history, first we have to ask about whether there's any family history of any coagulation, uh, you know, excess bleeding profile. Then second thing is, when, if the patient is getting bruising or epistaxis or gum bleeding or bleeding during a, uh, some dental work. And as seen in this patient, she has heavy menstrual bleed. That is, her hemoglobin has gone to 8. That means it's, mm. you know, it's not moderate. It's more than moderate. It's severe anemia. Uh, it's going in that severe uh, uh, bleeding. So these cases, you have to screen them for von Willebrand. Uh, uh, that, that profile has to be checked. Factor 8 and von Willebrand factor has to be checked. So... So how will you assess, what is the, we have already discussed this. Then usually they give some complaints about, they have a feeling of flooding and they may have been treated for anemia, isn't it? Yeah. So how can, what is the pictorial blood assessment chart and what is its significance? So this is for the patient and a pa patient to understand how much she's bleeding and it, it helps us to be communicated to the doctor because you know, it's very, unless you give them some method, 
of how to assess their own blood loss and communicate it to the doctor uh, you know we will not be able to blood loss so using that the pictorial method when it's slightly stained you make that you know it's a diagram where you make a small red line if it's moderately stained it's a bigger red line and if it's completely stroke you cover the entire pad so in this way we, they are they are able to you know assess their own blood loss and communicate it to the healthcare provider the how much she is bleeding so this helps in you know treating yes. the patient better yes definitely so management of uh, von willebrand willebrand's disease in aub how will you how will you go about it so once you have screened the patient and made a diagnosis then next you go on to controlling the bleeding and treating the anemia these are two things so uh, yeah. the best method would be to give a estrogen progesterone uh, contraceptive pill and that would reduce the blood loss but if they are not uh, responding to the estrogen progesterone combination then desmopressin is available desmopressin is actually an analog of uh, vasopressin and that is very useful in controlling bleeding episodes in a patient with coagulation profile because desmopressin increases the von willebrand factor as also factor 8 8 so yes. in these cases how do you manage first thing is when the bleeding is severe bleeding you have to check for hemodynamic instability and if she is unstable you have to you know to take measures to correct the instability by giving iv fluids or blood and whatever suppose the uh, hemoglobin uh, is between 7 and 10 and with active bleeding then again it is classified as severe bleeding uh home management may be possible if the bleeding is between 8 and 10 and uh, and if the patient is hemodynamically stable if the patient is not hemodynamically stable it is better to be hospitalized and uh, uh symptomatic anemia that is if the patient is feeling she is tired she cannot concentrate on her class you know she cannot do with her regular extracurricular activities that is symptomatic anemia all these things are classified under the severe bleeding and they all need such patients need to be hospitalized the need for giving iv conjugated estrogen personally i have not given iv conjugated estrogen in such a situation i would give uh, the oral contraceptive pills every 6 hourly till the bleeding is controlled uh, that would be my line of management yes uh, and how, what about hormone therapy yeah so hormone therapy uh, again oc pills would remain uh, would be a better choice because you have estrogen plus progesterone and as one of the previous speakers said the the denuded and uh, epithelium estrogen gives a better healing for that so we could go for a higher dose of estrogen that is maybe with 30 or 35 and uh, as i mentioned earlier one pill every 6 hours till the bleeding is uh, subsided and after that one pill every 12 hours for next two weeks so after three, you give three weeks of therapy and then stop the uh, treatment uh, so you know the, the treatment is for a period of maybe 21 days but all these hormones where they definitely produce a lot of vomiting so you have to cover them up with odansetron or you know phenergan or something like that yes okay thank you and uh, what about maintenance hemostatic treatment hemostatic uh, any idea treatment? about yeah hemostatic definitely tranexamic acid is a very good drug it's it's a wonder drug as far as uh, uh, you know aub is concerned but we have to give the correct dose i think we have to give 1 gram if you are giving iv preparation you have to give 1 gram it's not one ampule it's 1 gram uh, and here it says 1 1.3 mg 3 times a day for up to 5 days this this produces a very good effect uh, on the uh, it has a uh, reduces the bleeding considerably and again amnocaproic acid i have not personally used that drug but it seems to be a again it's it's one of the uh, it's connected to the transmic acid only and it also provides a good hemostatic control so uh, talk, so that is the acute phase now talking about the maintenance it is definitely the Uh, oral uh, hormones that is oral contraceptive pills 
or maybe lnius i don't know how much you would use it for an adolescent and dmpa again mm. it is a injectable and it produces variable bleeding and all that so i would stick to uh, oral contraceptive pills for a period of 3 to 6 months okay that's fine so i definitely have got an idea about what to do in a case of a bleeding disorder so thank you so much dr smriti now i'll go on to dr tulsi so dr tulsi are you there yes ma'am good evening now <laughs> so this is a 15 year old girl with menarche one year ago regular cycles 5 by 30 days since menarche menorrhagia in the present cycle for 8 days one episode of giddiness and hemoglobin 8 grams a febrile pallor is there one unit of pc was pcb uh, was transfused that is paxil and she was started on hormones on the day 2 of admission ultrasound showed features of serocytosis and falling platelet count attenders then revealed the history of fever 3 days ago diagnosis suggestive of viral hemorrhagic fever now what will you do yes ma'am so this is a tricky situation actually this is a rare not like a typical gynec situation we can see she was having regular cycle and this this time she got menorrhagia along with this uh, hp drop of 8 gram person and now she got a history of fever and platelets are reduced and so we can see it's a case of viral hemorrhagic fever so just by treating her as a gynec thing we have to treat in collaboration with the phys physician and treat her in a systemic full systemic management so we have to stop the bleeding and along with it correct the platelet correction also with platelet rich plasma and the blood transfusion and also the hormone part we have to correct so we can give tranexamic acid and progestins in case of she need of she need the correction of these bleeding things now and along with we have to correct the the hemorrhagic fever part along with the physician yes so the yeah. uh, differential diagnosis of aub in adolescents yeah always uh, think about the pregnancy and related conditions like so that we can uh, avoid mis the kind of the disease of miscarriage ectopic pregnancy and the trophoblastic diseases and history of medications like anticoagulants digoxin antipsychotics ocps and corticosteroids sometimes the herbal supplements in the depression case ssris and tamoxifen uh, or the thyroid you have to always rule out the thyroid dysfunctions thyroid replacement therapy hypo and hyperthyroidism everything systemic conditions like the adrenal hyperplasia the cushing's disease blood dyscrasia coagulopathies pituitary tumors always the pcos it's a, it's a very common condition in our adolescents and the renal thyroid and hepatic diseases and the genital tract pathologies which are like the infections cervical endometrial myometrial tubal factors and the rare causes sometimes the structural things the benign conditions like an adenomyosis fibroid and the cervical and endometrial polyp and the premalignant lesions cell like cervical dysplasia endometrial hyperplasia etc and rarely the malignant lesions also we have to see the cervical endometrial lesion producing tumors of tumors like the endodermal sinus tumors the disc germinomas the teratomas everything and testosterone producing tumors and myosarcomas everything should be in consideration even though if it is rare wonderful so see you have covered it all in one <laughs> and now coming to the diagnosis and management of aub in adolescents can you just give us a bird side view yeah always the clinical evaluation is the most important and all we have to see the bleeding or, or the rule out the bleeding disorders and thyroid dysfunctions and if it is there you have to investigate accordingly and treat accordingly if it is there, if it is not there if in case of profuse bleeding always give high dose progesterone followed by cyclical progesterone over 3 to 6 months moderate bleeding we can give cyclical progesterone also combined pills so what about uh, surgical options anything like uh, in puberty menorrhagia any surgical options are there one second uh. okay next Surg case please yeah. case 5 uh, it is a girl of 16 years i think it is uh, tulsi you can continue menarche at 14 years 
Yes. I can't see the slide properly. Yeah, this is a case of Menaki, uh, patient aged 16 years and 14 years, she is Menaki and passed, like experienced amenorrhea for two months, six months prior. Initial treatment, blood workup followed by iron supplementation and progesterone for withdrawal bleeding. And the treatment part resumed irregular cycles approximately every 45 days with prolonged duration. And the ongoing management is prescribed hematinics, pranexamic acid, and progesterone. Complications, severe pain during current cycle. And diagnosis, ultrasound revealed ovarian cyst. Surgical intervention done, ovarian cystectomy performed. Pathology result came as benign, granulosa cell tumor confirmed. So, okay. yeah. Uh, so, uh, in, in this scenario, we have to, sometimes we have to think about like uh, for every patient we don't have to go for a ultrasound in the initial thing but the cycles are irregular persistently we always have to think about a routine like ultrasound and see for any kind of structural anomalies like this ovarian or uterine things so in this case she got an ovarian cyst turned out to be granulosa cell tumor which is, com which is ki kind of common. And we have to see whether it is, uh, I always evaluate how it is a tumor and do the serum tumor markers like LDH, alpha fetoprotein, the HCG, everything. Also see how it is, go is going to be malignant. Always consider an onco consultation al along with it and go for MRI and PET scan to see the malignant CT kind of chances and treat accordingly. And usually conservative things are necessary. Uh, it will go, but sometimes in case of malignancy, we have to think about the staging, laparotomy, and things. So this all can happen, even though it is rare. So we have to keep it in mind. So surgical option is very limited in puberty yes. menorrhagia, but sometimes yes, we have to think. It is necessary. Yes, we have to think of that also. Even fibroids, ovarian cysts, endometriosis. Yes. In fact, one of my nieces who was studying in school had a huge fibroid. We, she was uh, always suffering from, uh, was complaining of bleeding, abdominal pain. And we used to just say, it's okay, this happens, it will uh, go off after some time. But after ultrasound was done, we discovered that uh, fibroid and she had to have a laparotomy. So we cannot always dismiss, no? So as you say, yes. surgical uh, problems may, the, may be there and we should consider. So what about endometrial biopsy? So when should we do it? Yeah, one should consider endometrial biopsy for adolescent with two to three years history of untreated anovulatory bleeding only as a last resort and also in obese female less than 20 years of age. Okay. And uh, what about, <clears throat> in conclusion, what can you say about puberty menorrhagia? It's puberty one of menorrhagia. the most common menstrual disorders. Come yes. on, what do you say? Yes. Ma'am, the most common is always the anovulation because of the immature HPO axis. So we can reassure the reassure them diet and iron is the only therapy required in some in most of the cases. Rest of the cases are easily treated with either the prostaglandins or like this inhibitors and OCPs. If does not respond to this expected fashion in three to six months or has initial low HP, further evaluation and workup is always essential. Okay, that was wonderful. Now, what is the take-home message that you would like to give? All of you give one line, five of you. So, starting with Bindu. Bindu, just give one line, what you would like to say as a take-home message. Anything? I, it's a, um, bleeding is un, not uncommon in underless mm -hmm. and especially uh, always roll out pregnancy in all cases. In this era. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what about Anjana? Anjana, are you there? And the role of DNC is also, ma'am, we haven't mentioned that. Role of DNC. Ah, yes. All the uh, all the methods fail. Uh, uh, all the treatment methods fail for six months. After that, we have to consider DNC also. Yes. Even those and actually, a very, very um, a presentation of tuberculosis of the endometrium also comes with bleeding, which can be diagnosed with this. And what about uh, Anjana? You'd like to say something? Take home yes, one line. Huh? Yeah, I would like to add on to all the uh, medical side of it. Uh, 
these are small adolescent girls that come to us for their uh, uh, complaints. So let us also provide uh, be a psychological companion also uh, along with our medical side. Okay. Thank you. Now to Preeta. Preeta? It has gone, let us. Then, Siti. Ma'am, like actually, what I, would like, uh, what I would like to say, I think something which we have already overlooked is stress. Because these girls have got so much of stress, yes. performance anxiety, you know, peer group pressure, appearance, so many things, you know. So, I think, yeah. uh, you know, spending think five minutes with them uh, alone without their mothers. Finding about what is the stress they are going through, you know, sometimes they don't even talk about these things to their mothers. Uh, their mothers don't have the time or the thought process that, you know, they are going through a lot of performance anxiety, peer group pressure regarding so many things about their appearance, dressing, everything. So you can just spend some five minutes, just like Anjana said, you can be a good friend to them. And that will help tide over because the stress definitely affects the HPO axis and it worsens their problems. Absolutely. That's where that's a that was a very nice point, Dr. Smithy. And now back to Tulu. Tulsi. Ma'am, in the Zira, we have we are seeing a lot of cases of PCO, and people are aware about it. So we should uh, tell them the what are the things to be done and the lifestyle modifications and what are things to be cared so that they can be like treated nicely than like without any other kind of treatment. So all are like aware of PCOs, but they don't know what to do. So exactly. We have to know, we have to work to know, uh, tell them to be like specific about their needs and kind of motivate motivations that they need to complain. Yes, I was just waiting for that point, you know, because lifestyle modification is very important. Nowadays, everybody is just sitting, sitting, sitting with in front of the computer, mobiles, etc. Yes. So that is very important. So thank you all very much for the wonderful deliberations. Actually, I came in by accident because Sampath Kumari Madam could not come. And then suddenly Minnie had to leave for doing that ectopic pregnancy. So I just, as a stopgap, I got it. So thanks a lot for all the wonderful input. Thank you, Madam. And Sapna? Yeah, thank you, Madam, <laughs> so much for uh, saving the uh, vote. Sure. Thank you so much for last minute uh, entry, but you have did a, you did a splendid job, actually. Thank you, Suchitra, ma'am, Dr. Mini, madam, everyone. They really deserve a big applaud to put together, you know, all the different sure. case scenarios and which gave us complete overview of uh, AOB in adolescence. Thank you so much, madam. You went through all the case uh, so beautifully. Thank you so much, madam. Um, any uh, queries Thanks. that has been put forth, madam? Uh, should we check in the... I, I think that um, that bit for Letrosol was something interesting because yeah, animation is causing the bleeding, so why not do that? That is a um, new line of thought. Madam, but I, <laughs> I think we should... Uh, excuse me, I read in some journal that during uh, uh, only six cycles Letrosol can be given. I don't know if it is true or not. You know, you can't go on giving letros like that. So I don't know. The infertility specialist would be a better person to answer that question. Can you just give on go on giving <laughs> letros like we give OC pills? Yeah. See, in the, <laughs> in the research paper recently published, it's a, actually a meta-analysis involving so many centers. They have given letrosol up to 12 months. And mm -hmm. they're comparing the side effects of letrosol versus OC pills. The side effects reported with OC pills are much, much higher than with uh, letrosol. Mm -hmm. And uh, letrosol, it oh. is actually basically an anti-estrogen as well. So uh, it gives uh, say, this unopposed estrogen effect as well as the ovulatory effect, which is causing the progesterone release. So these are the beneficial effects. And very often following this uh, six cycles of uh, letrosol, what they have followed up the case for the next two years, and the ovulation has been resumed in these uh, particular patients. Okay. 
So you mean to say okay. there is no problem with giving letrozol for 12 months and, you know, there's no See, restriction. Like because, that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are even protocols of letrozol being given for long term uh, in patients with endometriosis. So the ultimately OCP is something you give in the cycle. Next cycle, if you skip it, no effect for that uh, OCP at all. Rather than OCP can create a lot of troubles because of the presence of estrogen. So that's why, see, it's a coming up. Uh, uh, yeah, the research is going on. A lot many guidelines may come up in the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Uh, one more question in the question chat box. What specific test for coagulopathy? Uh, it is directed to Dr. Bindu, ma'am. What specific test for coagulopathy will you suggest? Uh, Dr. Hema Varir, madam, has asked. Unmute. Sorry. Um, you can assess various Dr. plots. Smithy? Yeah, uh, see, I yeah, think it is a history of the coagulation factors has to be done. And I think it is better to uh, consult with the hematologist because we are not very familiar with, you know, all the assays of all the coagulation factors and all that. So if there is a case of one Willy brand, we'll have to uh, get across to a hematologist and, uh, you know, work in tandem with them. Okay, madam. The uh, other question is uh, from Dr. Rajni, uh, who has asked, uh, one of the causes of adolescent AUB is pregnancy. When a teenage girl approaches for MTP legally, should we ask for parents as bystanders? Or if she's accompanied by her boyfriend, is it okay to, to go ahead after due legal form completion? So Boxo, Boxo. Don't go, Jane. <laughs> Box up, box up. <laughs> uh, anyone wants to answer that? Please be careful. Depending and on the age, your answer will be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> it is always, I think, it is always to, to have to inform the. Uh, Police and you re really require a guardian actually it will depend upon what age it is actually is it uh, 12 years or you know uh, about 12 years or you know between 12 to 13 i mean 12 to 16 so i think uh, always it is safer as a parents to go as a bystanders it is no. my personal view always always um yes. I'll, Sir, Kunimajin, sir, shall we call it as a day? Yeah, certainly. And okay. uh, yes. so, <laughs> to the last question, see, yeah. uh, the society and the law have to change a lot. Uh, we are still maybe living in the past. Uh, so I think in the future, more uh, better guidelines will come, better laws will come, uh, specifically for a gender equality world. So thank you. Uh, shall I make the final comments? Ajit, yes, sir. Ajit, sir, sir. Ajit, sir, please, any comments? Any boxer related comments? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Basically, uh, I thank, a big thanks to everyone who have assembled here, log in here uh, for this wonderful webinar. And a special thanks to Dr. Sujitra Ma'am for uh, coordinating this uh, wonderful webinar and uh, Sopna for this uh, beautiful voice and all the faculty, senior faculty, my friend Dr. Ajit and uh, everyone. I just don't want to miss anyone. So I mentioned everyone. So big, big thanks. A very good night. And we'll be waiting for the next webinar on 11th April. That will be done by the Maternal and Fetal Medicine Company. Thank you. Thank good night. You. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. We enjoyed it. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night, buddy.